Introduction Don't allow a winner's game to become a loser's game. Let's start from the beginning. What is an index fund? It is simply a basket, portfolio, that holds many, many eggs, stocks, designed to mimic the overall performance of any financial market or market sector. Footnote. Please keep in mind that an index may also be constructed around bonds in the bond market, or even road less traveled asset classes such as commodities or real estate. Today, if you wish, you could literally hold all of your wealth in a diversified set of index funds representing asset classes within the U.S. or the global economy. Classic index funds, by definition, basically represent the entire stock market basket, not just a few scattered eggs. Such index funds eliminate the risk of individual stocks, the risk of market sectors, and the risk of manager selection, with only stock market risk remaining, which is quite large enough, thank you. Index funds make up for their lack of excitement by their truly remarkable long-term productivity. This is much more than a book about index funds. It is a book that is determined to change the very way that you think about investing. For when you understand how our financial markets actually work, you will see that the index fund is indeed the only investment that guarantees that you will capture your fair share of the returns that American business earns. Thanks to the miracle of compounding, the accumulations of wealth over the years generated by those returns have been little short of fantastic. I'm speaking here about the classic index fund, one that is broadly diversified, holding all or almost all of its share of the $15 trillion capitalization of the U.S. stock market, operating with minimal expenses and without advisory fees, with tiny portfolio turnover, and with high tax efficiency. The index fund simply owns corporate America, buying an interest in each stock in the stock market in proportion to its market capitalization and then holding it forever. Please don't underestimate the power of compounding the generous returns earned by our businesses. Over the past century, our corporations have earned a return on their capital of 9.5% per year. Compounded at that rate over a decade, each $1 initially invested grows to $2.48. Over two decades, $6.14. Over three decades, $15.22. Over four decades, $37.72. And over five decades, $93.48. Footnote. These accumulations are measured in nominal dollars, with no adjustment for the long-term decline in their buying power, averaging about 3% a year since the 20th century began. If we use real inflation-adjusted dollars, the return drops from 9.5% to 6.5%. As a result, the accumulations of an initial investment of $1 would be $1.88, $3.52, $6.61, $12.42, and $23.31 for respective periods. The magic of compounding is little short of a miracle. Simply put, Thanks to the growth, productivity, resourcefulness, and innovation of our corporations, capitalism creates wealth, a positive-sum game for its owners. Investing in equities is a winner's game. The returns earned by business are ultimately translated into the returns earned by the stock market itself. I have no way of knowing what share of these returns you have earned in the past, but academic studies suggest that if you are a typical investor in individual stocks, your returns have probably lagged the market by about 2.5 percentage points per year. Applying that figure to the annual return of 12% earned over the past 25 years by the Standard & Poor's 500 Stock Index, your annual return has been less than 10%. Result, your slice of the market pie, as it were, has been less than 80%. To make matters worse, as you will see in Chapter 5, if you are a typical investor in mutual funds, you've done even worse. If you don't believe that is what most investors experience, think for a moment, please, about the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. These iron rules define the game. As investors, all of us as a group earn the stock market's return. As a group, I hope you're sitting down for this astonishing revelation, we are average. Each extra return that one of us earns means that another of our fellow investors suffers a return shortfall of precisely the same dimension. 
Before the deduction of the cost of investing, beating the stock market is a zero-sum game. But the costs of playing the investment game both reduce the gains of the winners and increases the losses of the losers. So who wins? You know who wins. The man in the middle. Actually, the men and women in the middle. The brokers, the investment bankers, the money managers, the marketers, the lawyers, the accountants, the operations departments of our financial system is the only sure winner in the game of investing. Our financial croupiers always win. In the casino, the house always wins. In horse racing, the track always wins. In the trifecta lottery, the state always wins. Investing is no different. After the deduction of the cost of investing, beating the stock market is a loser's game. Don't allow a winner's game to become a loser's game. Yes, after the cost of financial intermediation, all those brokerage commissions, portfolio transaction costs, and fund operating expenses, all those investment management fees, all those advertising dollars, and all those marketing schemes, and all those legal costs and custodial fees that we pay day after day and year after year, beating the market is inevitably a game for losers. No matter how many books are published and promoted purporting to show how easy it is to win, investors fall short. Indeed, when we add the cost of these self-help investment books into the equation, it becomes even more of a loser's game. The wonderful magic of compounding that is reflected in the long-term returns earned by American business, then, is translated into equally wonderful returns in the stock market. But those returns are overwhelmed by the powerful tyranny of compounding the costs of investing. For those who choose to play the game, the odds in favor of the successful achievement of superior returns are terrible. Simply playing the game consigns the average investor to a woeful shortfall to the returns generated by the stock market over the long term. Most investors in stocks, of course, think that they can avoid the pitfalls of investing by due diligence and knowledge trading stocks with alacrity in order to stay one step ahead of the game. But the fact is that while the investors who trade the least have a fighting chance of capturing the market's return, those who trade the most are doomed to failure. For example, an academic study showed that the most active one-fifth of all stock traders turn their portfolios over at the rate of more than 21% per month. While they earn the market return of 17.9% per year during the period 1990 to 1996, they incurred trading costs of about 6.5%, leaving them with an annual return of but 11.4%, only two-thirds of the return in that strong market upsurge. Mutual fund investors, too, have inflated ideas of their own omniscience. They pick funds based on the recent performance superiority of fund managers, or even their long-term superiority, and hire advisors to help them do the same thing. But the advisors do it with even less success. See chapters 8, 9, and 10. Oblivious of the toll taken by costs, fund investors willingly pay heavy sales loads and incur excessive fund fees and expenses, and are unknowingly subjected to the substantial but hidden transaction costs incurred by funds as a result of their hyperactive portfolio turnover. Fund investors are confident that they can easily select superior fund managers. They are wrong. Contrarily, for those who invest and then drop out of the game and never pay a single unnecessary cost, the odds in favor of success are awesome. Why? Simply because they own businesses. And businesses as a group earn substantial returns on their capital and pay out dividends to their owners. Yes, many individual companies fail. Firms with flawed ideas and rigid strategies and weak managements ultimately fall victim to the creative destruction that is the hallmark of competitive capitalism, the formulation of Joseph E. Schumpeter in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, 1942. But in the aggregate, businesses grow with the long-term growth of our vibrant economy. This book will tell you why you should stop contributing to the croupiers of the financial markets who rake in something like $400 billion each year from you and your fellow investors. It will also tell you how easy it is to do just that. Simply buy the entire stock market. Then, once you've bought your stocks, get out of the casino and stay out. Just hold the market portfolio forever. And that's what the index fund does.
This investment philosophy is not only simple and elegant, the arithmetic on which it is based is irrefutable. But so long as investors accept the status quo of today's crazy quilt financial market system, so long as they enjoy the excitement, however costly, of buying and selling stocks, so long as they fail to realize that there is a better way, such a philosophy will seem counterintuitive. But I ask you to carefully consider the impassioned message of this little book. When you do, you too will want to join the revolution and invest in a new, more economical, more efficient, even more honest way, a more productive way, a way that will put your own interest first. It may seem far-fetched for me to hope that any single little book could ignite the spark of a revolution in investing. New ideas that fly in the face of the conventional wisdom of the day are always greeted with doubt, scorn, and even fear. Indeed, 230 years ago, the same challenge was faced by Thomas Paine, whose 1776 tract, Common Sense, helped spark the American Revolution. Here is what Tom Paine wrote. Perhaps the sentiments contained in the following pages are not yet sufficiently fashionable to procure them general favor. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom. But the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. In the following pages, I offer nothing more than simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense, and have no other preliminaries to settle with the reader than that he will divest himself of prejudice and prepossession, and suffer his reason and his feelings to determine for themselves that he will put on, or rather that he will not put off, the true character of a man, and generously enlarge his views beyond the present day. As we now know, Thomas Paine's powerful and articulate arguments carried the day. The American Revolution led to our Constitution, which to this day defines the responsibility of our government, our citizens, and the fabric of our society. Inspired by his words, I titled my 1999 book, Common Sense on Mutual Funds, and asked investors to divest themselves of prejudice and to generously enlarge their views beyond the present day. In this new book, I reiterate that proposition. In Common Sense on Mutual Funds, I also apply to my idealistic self these words of the late journalist Michael Kelly. The driving dream of the idealist is that if he could only explain things to enough people, carefully enough, thoroughly enough, thoughtfully enough, why eventually everyone would see and then everything would be fixed. This book is my attempt to explain the financial system to as many of you who will listen, carefully enough, thoroughly enough, and thoughtfully enough so that you will see and it will be fixed, or at least that your own participation in it will be fixed. Some may suggest that, as the creator both of Vanguard in 1974 and of the world's first index mutual fund in 1975, I have a vested interest in persuading you of my views. Well, of course I do, but not because it enriches me to do so. It doesn't earn me a penny. Rather, I want to persuade you because the very elements that formed Vanguard's foundation all those years ago, all those values and structures and strategies, will enrich you. In the early years of indexing, my voice was a lonely one. But there were a few other thoughtful and respected believers whose ideas inspired me to carry on my mission. Today, many of the wisest and most successful investors endorse the index fund concept, and among academics, the acceptance is close to universal. But don't take my word for it. Listen to these independent experts with no axe to grind except for the truth about investing. You'll hear from some of them at the end of each chapter. Listen, for example, to this endorsement by Paul A. Samuelson, Nobel laureate and professor of economics at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, to whom this book is dedicated. Bogle's reasoned precepts can enable a few million of us savers to become in 20 years the envy of our suburban neighbors, while at the same time we have slept well in these eventful times. The financial system itself, alas, won't be fixed for a long time. But the glacial nature of that change doesn't prevent you from looking after your own self-interest. You don't need to participate in its expensive foolishness. If you choose to play the winner's game of owning businesses, 
and refrain from playing the loser's game of trying to beat the market. You can begin the task simply by using your own common sense, understanding the system, and investing in accordance with the only principles that will eliminate substantially all of its excessive costs. Then at last, whatever returns our businesses may be generous enough to deliver in the years ahead, reflected as they will be in our stock and bond markets, you will be guaranteed to earn your fair share. John C. Bogle, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, October 20, 2006 Don't take my word for it. Charles T. Munger, Warren Buffett's partner at Berkshire Hathaway, puts it this way, The general systems of money management today require people to pretend to do something they can't do and like something they don't. It's a funny business because, on a net basis, the whole investment management business together gives no value added to all buyers combined. That's the way it has to work. Mutual funds charge 2% per year, and then brokers switch people between funds, costing another 3 to 4 percentage points. The poor guy in the general public is getting a terrible product from the professionals. I think it's disgusting. It's much better to be part of a system that delivers value to the people who buy the product. William Bernstein, investment advisor and neurologist, and author of The Four Pillars of Investing, says, It's bad enough that you have to take market risk. Only a fool takes on the additional risk of doing yet more damage by failing to diversify properly with his or her nest egg. Avoid the problem. Buy a well-run index fund and own the whole market. Here's how The Economist of London puts it. The truth is that, for the most part, fund managers have offered extremely poor value for money. Their records of outperformance are almost always followed by stretches of underperformance. Over long periods of time, hardly any fund managers have beaten the market averages. They encourage investors, rather than spread their risks wisely or seek the best match for their future liabilities, to put their money into the most modish assets going often just when they become overvalued. And all the while they charge the clients big fees for the privilege of losing their money. One specific lesson is the merits of indexed investing. You will almost never find a fund manager who can repeatedly beat the market. It is better to invest in an indexed fund that promises a market return, but with significantly lower fees. Chapter 1 a parable with a moral. The Gottrocks family. Even before you think about index funds, in their most basic form, mutual funds that simply buy all of the stocks in the U.S. stock market and hold them forever, you must understand how the stock market actually works. Perhaps this homely parable, my version of a story told by Warren Buffett, chairman of Berkshire Hathaway Incorporated, in the firm's 2005 annual report, will help clarify the foolishness and counterproductivity of our vast and complex financial market system. Once upon a time, a wealthy family named the Gottrocks, grown over the generations to include thousands of brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, and cousins, owned 100% of every stock in America. Each year, they reaped the rewards of investing, all of the earnings growth that those thousands of corporations generated and all of the dividends that they distributed. To complicate matters just a bit, the Gottrocks family, of course, also purchased the new public offerings of securities that were issued each year. Each family member grew wealthier at the same pace, and all was harmonious. Their investment had compounded over the decades, creating enormous wealth, for the Gottrocks family was playing a winner's game. But after a while, a few fast-talking helpers persuade some of the Gottrocks cousins that they can earn a larger share than the other relatives. These helpers convince the cousins to sell some of their shares in the companies to other family members and to buy some shares of others from them in return. The helpers handle the transactions and, as brokers, receive commissions for their services. The ownership is thus rearranged among the family members. To their surprise, however, the family wealth begins to grow at a slower pace. Why? Because the family share of that generous pie that American industry bakes each year, all those dividends paid, all those earnings reinvested in the business, 100% at the outset, 
starts to decline simply because some of the return is now consumed by the helpers. To make matters worse, while the family had always paid taxes on their dividends, some of the members are now also paying taxes on the capital gains they realize from their stock swapping back and forth, further diminishing the family's total wealth. The smart cousins quickly realize that their plan has actually diminished the rate of growth in the family's wealth. They recognize that their foray into stock picking has been a failure and conclude that they need professional assistance the better to pick the right stocks for themselves. So they hire stock picking experts, more helpers, to gain an advantage. These money managers charge a fee for their services. So when the family appraises its wealth a year later, it finds that its share of the pie has diminished even further. To make matters still worse, the new managers feel the compulsion to earn their keep by trading the family's stocks at feverish levels of activity, not only increasing the brokerage commissions paid to the first set of helpers, but running up the tax bill as well. Now the family's earlier 100% share of the dividend and earnings pie is even further diminished. Well, we failed to pick good stocks for ourselves, and when that didn't work, we also failed to pick managers who could do so, the smart cousins say. What shall we do? Undeterred by their two previous failures, they decide to hire still more helpers. They retain the best investment consultants and financial planners they can find to advise them on how to select the right managers, who will then surely pick the right stocks. The consultants, of course, tell them that they can do exactly that. Just pay us a fee for our services, the new helpers assure the cousins, and all will be well. Alas, the family's share of the pie tumbles once again. Alarmed at last, the family sits down together and takes stock of the events that have transpired since some of them began to try to outsmart the others. How is it, they ask, that our original 100% share of the pie, made up each year of all of those dividends and earnings, has dwindled to just 60%? Their wisest member, a sage old uncle, softly responds, All that money you've paid to those helpers and all those unnecessary extra taxes you're paying come directly out of our family's total earnings and dividends. Go back to square one and do so immediately. Get rid of all your brokers. Get rid of all your money managers. Get rid of all your consultants. Then... Our family will again reap 100% of however large a pie that corporate America bakes for us year after year. They did exactly that, returning to their original passive but productive strategy, holding all of the stocks of corporate America and standing pat, exactly what an index fund does. And the Gottrocks family lived happily ever after. Adding a fourth law to Sir Isaac Newton's Three Laws of Motion, the inimitable Warren Buffett puts the moral of the story this way. For investors as a whole, returns decrease as motion increases. Accurate as that cryptic statement is, I'd add that the parable reflects the profound conflict of interest between those who work in the investment business and those who invest in stocks and bonds. The way to wealth for those in the business is to persuade their clients, don't just stand there, do something. But the way to wealth for their clients in the aggregate is to follow the opposite maxim, don't do something, just stand there. For that is the only way to avoid playing the loser's game of trying to beat the market. When any business is conducted in a way that directly defies the interests of its clients in the aggregate, it is only a matter of time until change comes. The moral of the story, then, is that successful investing is about owning businesses and reaping the huge rewards provided by the dividends and earnings growth of our nation's corporations. The higher the level of their investment activity, the greater the cost of financial intermediation and taxes, the less the net return that the business owners as a group receive. The lower the cost that investors as a group incur, the higher rewards that they reap. So to realize the winning returns generated by American business over the long term, the intelligent investor will minimize to the bare bones the costs of financial intermediation. That's what indexing is all about, and that's what this book is all about. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Jack R. Meyer, 
former president of Harvard Management Company, the remarkably successful wizard who tripled the Harvard Endowment Fund from $8 billion to $27 billion. Here's what he had to say in a Business Week interview. The investment business is a giant scam. Most people think they can find managers who can outperform, but most people are wrong. I will say that 85 to 90 percent of managers fail to match their benchmarks. Because managers have fees and incur transaction costs, you know that in the aggregate, they are deleting value. When asked if private investors can draw any lessons from what Harvard does, Mr. Meyer responded, Yes. First, get diversified. Come up with a portfolio that covers a lot of asset classes. Second, you want to keep your fees low. That means avoiding the most hyped but expensive funds in favor of low-cost index funds. And finally, invest for the long term. Investors should simply have index funds to keep their fees low and their taxes down. No doubt about it. In terms that are a bit more academic, Princeton professor Burton G. Malkiel, author of A Random Walk Down Wall Street, expresses these views. Index funds have regularly produced rates of return exceeding those of active managers by close to two percentage points. There are two fundamental reasons for this excess performance, management fees and trading costs. Public index funds are typically run at a fee of less than two-tenths of one percent. Actively managed public mutual funds charge annual management and market expenses that on average are 150 basis points one and a half percentage points per year. Moreover, index funds trade only when necessary, whereas active funds typically have a turnover rate close to 100 percent, and often even more, with trading costs of at least another one half to one percent of performance a year, and probably a lot more. Active management as a whole cannot achieve gross returns exceeding the market as a whole, and therefore they must, on average, underperform the indexes by the amount of these expense and transaction cost disadvantages. Experience conclusively shows that index fund buyers are likely to obtain results exceeding those of the typical fund manager, whose large advisory fees and substantial portfolio turnover tend to reduce investment yields. Many people will find the guarantee of playing the stock market game at par every round a very attractive one. The index fund is a sensible, serviceable method for obtaining the market's rate of return with absolutely no effort and minimal expense. Chapter 2 Business Reality Trumps Market Expectations Here begins the first lesson. That wonderful opening parable brings home the central reality of investing. The most that owners in the aggregate can earn between now and Judgment Day is what their business in the aggregate earns, in the words of Warren Buffett. Illustrating the point with Berkshire Hathaway, the publicly owned investment company he has run for 40 years, Buffett says, when the stock temporarily overperforms or underperforms the business, a limited number of shareholders, either sellers or buyers, receive outsized benefits at the expense of those they trade with. But over time, the aggregate gains made by Berkshire shareholders must of necessity match the business gains of the company. How often investors lose sight of that eternal principle, yet the record is crystal clear. History, if only we would take the trouble to look at it, reveals the remarkable, if essential, linkage between the cumulative long-term returns earned by American business, the annual dividend yield, plus the annual rate of earnings growth, and the cumulative returns earned by the U.S. stock market itself. Need proof? Just look at the record since the 20th century began. The average annual total return on stocks was 9.6 percent, virtually identical to the investment return of 9.5 percent, 4.5 percent from dividend yield, and 5 percent from earnings growth. That tiny difference of 0.1 percent per year arose from what I call speculative return, depending on how one looks at it, perhaps merely statistical noise, or perhaps from a generally upward long-term trend in stock valuations, reflecting the willingness of investors to pay higher prices for each dollar of earnings at the end of the period than at the beginning. Compounding these returns over 106 years, 
produced accumulations that are truly staggering. Each dollar initially invested in 1900 at an investment return of 9.5% grows by the close of 2005 to $14,808. Sure, few, if any, of us have 106 years in us, but, like the Gottrocks family over the generations, the miracle of compounding returns is little short of amazing, perhaps the ultimate winner's game. Footnote. But let's be fair. If we compounded that initial $1, not at the nominal return of 9.5%, but at the real, after inflation rate of 6.5%, the accumulation grows to $793 but increasing real wealth nearly eight times over is not to be sneezed at. Yes, there are bumps along the way in the investment returns earned by our business corporations. Sometimes, as in the Great Depression of the early 1930s, these bumps are large. But we get over them. So, if you stand back and squint your eyes, the trend of business fundamentals looks almost like a straight line sloping gently upward, and those periodic bumps are barely visible. Note, however, that stock market returns sometimes get well ahead of business fundamentals. The late 1920s, the early 1970s, the late 1990s. But it has been only a matter of time until, as if drawn by a magnet, they soon return, although often only after falling well behind for a time. The mid-1940s, the late 1970s, the 2003 market lows. In our foolish focus on the short-term stock market distractions of the moment, we too often overlook this long history. We ignore the fact that when the returns on stocks depart materially from the long-term norm, it is rarely because of the economics of investing, the earnings growth and dividend yields of America's corporations. Rather, the reason that annual stock returns are so volatile is largely because of the emotions of investing. We can measure these emotions by the price-earnings ratio, which measures the number of dollars investors are willing to pay for each dollar of earnings. As investor confidence waxes and wanes, P.E. multiples rise and fall. Changes in interest rates also have an impact, uneven though it may be, on the P.E. multiple. So I'm oversimplifying a bit here. When greed holds sway, we see very high P.E.s. When hope prevails, moderate P.E.s. When fear is in the saddle, P.E.s are very low. Back and forth, over and over again, swings in the emotions of investors momentarily derail the long-range upward trend in the economics of investing. While the prices we pay for stocks often lose touch with the reality of corporate values, in the long run, it is reality that rules. So while investors seem to intuitively accept the idea that the past is inevitably prologue to the future, any past stock market returns that have included a high speculative stock return component are deeply flawed as a guide to what now lies ahead. To understand why past returns do not foretell the future, we need only heed the words of the great British economist John Maynard Keynes, written 70 years ago. It is dangerous to apply to the future inductive arguments based on past experience unless one can distinguish the broad reasons why past experience was what it was. But if we can distinguish the reasons why the past was what it was, then we can establish reasonable expectations about the future. Keynes helped us make this distinction by pointing out that the state of long-term expectation for stocks is a combination of enterprise, forecasting the prospective yield of assets over their whole life, and speculation, forecasting the psychology of the market. Chapter 12 of The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, John Maynard Keynes, 1936. I'm well familiar with those words. For 55 years ago, I incorporated them in my senior thesis at Princeton, written providentially for my lifetime career that followed, on The Economic Role of the Investment Company, the title I chose for the thesis. This dual nature of returns is clearly reflected when we look at stock market returns over the decades. Using Keynes idea, I divide stock market returns into 1. Investment return, enterprise, consisting of the initial dividend yield on stocks plus their subsequent earnings growth, together the essence of what we call intrinsic value, and 2. Speculative return, 
the impact of changing price earnings multiples on stock prices. Let's start with the average annual returns on stocks over the decades since 1900. The steady contribution of dividend yields to total return during each decade is always positive, only once outside the range of 3% to 7%, and averaging 4.5%. The contribution of earnings growth to investment return, with the exception of the Depression-ridden 1930s, was positive in every decade, usually running between 4% and 7%, and averaging 5% per year. Result? Total investment returns, which combine dividend yield and earnings growth, were negative in only a single decade, again the 1930s. These total investment returns, the gains made by business, were remarkably steady, generally running in the range of 8% to 13% per year, and averaging 9.5%. Enter speculative return. Compared with the relative consistency of dividends and earnings growth over the decades, truly wild variations in speculative return occur as price-earnings ratios, PEs, wax and wane. A 100% rise in the PE from 10 to 20 times over a decade, for example, would equate to a 7.2% annual speculative return. Curiously, without exception, every decade of significantly negative speculative return was immediately followed by a decade in which it turned positive by a correlative amount. The quiet 1910s and then the roaring 1920s, the dispiriting 1940s and then the booming 1950s, the discouraging 1970s and then the soaring 1980s. Reversion to the mean, RTM, writ large. Then, amazingly, we see an unprecedented second consecutive exuberant increase in speculative return in the 1990s, a pattern never before in evidence. By the close of 1999, the P.E. rate had risen to an unprecedented level of 32 times, setting the stage for the return to sanity in valuations that soon followed. The tumble in stock market prices gave us our comeuppance. With earnings continuing to rise, the P.E. currently stands at 18 times, compared to the 15 times level prevailing at the start of the 20th century. As a result, speculative return is added just 0.1 percentage points to the annual investment return earned by our businesses over the long term. When we combine these two sources of stock returns, we get the total return produced by the stock market itself. Despite the huge impact of speculative return, up and down, during most of the individual decades, there is virtually no impact over the long term. The average annual total return on stocks of 9.6% then has been created almost entirely by enterprise with only 0.1 percentage point created by speculation. The message is clear. In the long run, stock returns depend almost entirely on the reality of the investment returns earned by our corporations. The perception of investors, reflected by the speculative returns, counts for little. It is economics that controls long-term equity returns. Emotions, so dominant in the short term, dissolve. Even after almost 55 years in this business, however, I have absolutely no idea how to forecast these swings in investor emotions. I'm not alone. I don't know anyone else who has done so successfully, or even anyone who knows anyone who has done so. In fact, 70 years of financial research shows that no one has done so. But largely because the arithmetic of investing is so simple, I believe I can forecast the long-term economics of investing with remarkably high odds of success. Why? Simply because it is investment returns, the earnings and dividends generated by American business, that are almost entirely responsible for the returns delivered in our stock market. Put another way, while illusion, the momentary prices we pay for stocks, often loses touch with reality, the intrinsic values of our corporations, in the long run, it is reality that rules. To drive this point home, think of investing as consisting of two different games. Here's how Roger Martin, Dean of the Rotman School of Management of the University of Toronto describes them. One is the real market, where giant publicly held companies compete, where real companies spend real money to make and sell real products and services, 
and, if they play with skill, earn real profits. This game also requires real strategy, determination, and expertise, real innovation, and real foresight. Loosely linked to this game is another game, the expectations market. Here, prices are not set by real things like sales margins or profits. In the short term, stock prices go up only when the expectations of investors rise, not necessarily when sales, margins, or profits rise. To this crucial distinction, I would only add that the expectations market is not only a product of the expectations of active investors, but the expectations of active speculators, trying to guess what these investors will expect and how they will act as each new bit of information finds its way into the marketplace. The expectations market is about speculation. The real market is about investing. The only logical conclusion the stock market is itself a giant distraction that causes investors to focus on transitory and volatile investment expectations rather than what is really important, the gradual accumulation of the returns earned by corporate business. My advice to investors is to ignore the short-term noise of our emotions reflected in our financial markets and focus on the productive long-term economics of our corporate businesses. Shakespeare could have been describing the inexplainable hourly and daily, sometimes even yearly or longer, fluctuations in the stock market when he wrote, like a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. The way to investment success is to get out of the expectations market of stock prices and cast your lot with the real market of business. Don't take my word for it. Simply heed the timeless distinction made by Benjamin Graham, legendary investor, author of The Intelligent Investor, and mentor to Warren Buffett. He was right on the money when he put his finger on the essential reality of investing. In the short run, the stock market is a voting machine. But in the long run, it is a weighing machine. Ben Graham continues, using his wonderful metaphor of Mr. Market, the investor with a portfolio of sound stocks should expect their prices to fluctuate and should neither be concerned by sizable declines nor become excited by sizable advances. He should always remember that market quotations are there for his convenience, either to be taken advantage of or to be ignored. Imagine that in some private business you own a small share which cost you $1,000. One of your partners, named Mr. Market, is very obliging indeed. Every day he tells you what he thinks your interest is worth, and furthermore, offers either to buy you out or to sell you an additional interest on that basis. Sometimes his idea of value appears plausible and justified by business developments and prospects. Often, on the other hand, Mr. Market lets his enthusiasm or his fears run away with him, and the value he proposes seems little short of silly. If you are a prudent investor, will you let Mr. Market's daily communication determine your view as the value of your $1,000 interest in the enterprise? Only in case you agree with him, or in case you want to trade with him. Most of the time, you will be wiser to form your own ideas of the value of your holdings. The true investor will do better if he forgets about the stock market and pays attention to his dividend returns and to the operating results of his companies. Chapter 3. Casting Your Lot with Business. Occam's Razor Writ Large. So how do you cast your lot with business? Simply by buying a portfolio that owns the shares of every business in America and then holding it forever. It's a simple concept that guarantees that you will win the investment game played by most other investors who, as a group, are guaranteed to lose. Please don't equate simplicity with stupidity. Way back in 1320, William of Ockham expressed it well, essentially setting forth the precept that, when there are multiple solutions to a problem, choose the simplest one. William of Ockham actually expressed it more elegantly. Entities should not be multiplied unnecessarily. But the point is unmistakable. And so Ockham's razor came to represent a major principle of scientific inquiry. And so, too, is owning all of U.S. business the essence of simplicity achieved by holding the stock market portfolio. For most of the past 80 years, 
The accepted stock market portfolio was represented by the Standard & Poor's 500 Stock Index, created in 1926 and now holding a list of 500 stocks, essentially composed of America's 500 largest corporations, weighted by the value of their market capitalizations. The index originally included just 90 companies, rising to 500 in 1957. In recent years, these 500 stocks have represented about 80% of the market value of all U.S. stocks. The beauty of a cap-weighted index is that it automatically adjusts to changing stock prices and never has to buy and sell stocks for that reason. With the enormous growth of corporate pension funds during the 1950 to 1990 era, it was an ideal measurement standard, the benchmark or hurdle rate that would be the comparative standard for how their professional managers were performing. Today, the S&P 500 remains a valid standard against which to compare the returns earned by the professional managers of pension funds and mutual funds. In 1970, an even more comprehensive measure of the U.S. stock market was developed. Originally called the Wilshire 5000, it is now named the Dow Jones Wilshire Total Stock Market Index. It includes some 4,971 stocks, including the 500 stocks in the S&P index. However, because its component stocks too are weighted by their market capitalization, those remaining 4,471 stocks account for only about 20% of its value. Nonetheless, this broadest of all U.S. stock indexes is the best measure of the aggregate value of stocks and therefore a superb measure of the returns earned in U.S. stocks by all investors as a group. Of course, the two indexes have very similar composition. Consider, for example, the 12 largest stocks in each and their weight in the construction of each index. It is hardly surprising that the two indexes have earned returns that are in lockstep with one another. The Center for Research and Security Prices at the University of Chicago has gone back to 1926 and calculated the returns earned by all U.S. stocks. Its data since 1970 have provided a virtually perfect match to the Dow Jones Wilshire Total Stock Market Index. In fact, returns of the two indexes parallel one another with near precision. From 1928 through 2006, you can hardly tell them apart. For the full period, the average annual return on the S&P 500 was 10.3%. The return on the total stock market was 10.1%. Of course, this represents what we call a period-dependent outcome. Everything depends on the starting date and the ending date. If we began the comparison at the beginning of 1930, instead of 1926, for example, the returns of the two were identical, 9.9% .9 per year. Yes, there are variations over the interim periods. The S&P 500 was much the stronger, for example, in 1982 through 1990, when its annual return of 15.6% outpaced the total market index return of 14%. But in recent years, 1998 through 2006, small and mid-cap stocks did better, and the total market index return of 3.4% per year nicely exceeded the 2.4% return of the S&P 500. But with a long-term correlation of 0.98 between the returns of the indexes, 1.0 is perfect correlation, there is little to choose between them. Whichever measure we use, it should now be obvious that the returns earned by the publicly held corporations that compose the U.S. stock market must of necessity equal the aggregate gross returns earned by all investors in that market as a group. Equally obvious, as we'll learn in detail in the next chapter, the net returns earned by these investors must of necessity fall short of those aggregate gross returns by the amount of intermediation costs they incur. Thus, the reality of investing is that investors as a group must lose to the returns earned by business. This reality is obvious. While owning the stock market over the long term is a winner's game, beating the stock market is a loser's game. Such an all-market fund is guaranteed to outpace over time the returns earned by equity investors as a group. Once you recognize this fact, you can see that the index fund is guaranteed to win not only over time, but every year and every month and week, even every minute of the day. Because no matter how long or short the time frame, 
Yes, the gross return in the stock market minus intermediation costs equals the net return earned by investors as a group. If the data do not prove that indexing wins, well, the data are wrong. Over the short term, however, it doesn't always look as if the S&P 500 index, still the most common basis of comparison for mutual funds and pension plans, or the Dow Jones Wilshire 5000 index is winning. That's because there is no possible way to calculate the returns earned by the millions of diverse participants, amateur and professional alike, Americans and investors in foreign countries, in the U.S. stock market. So what we do in the mutual fund field is calculate the returns of the various funds counting each fund rather than each fund's assets as one entry. Since there are lots of small cap and mid cap funds, usually with relatively modest asset basis, they make a disproportionate impact on the data. When small and mid cap funds are leading the total market, the all market index fund seems to lag. When small and mid cap stocks are lagging the market, the index fund looks formidable indeed. Nonetheless, the exercise of calculating how the returns earned by the stock market itself compares with returns earned by the average equity fund is both illuminating and persuasive. If we compare the results of what are described as large cap core funds with the returns of the S&P 500, because of its market capitalization weightings, a large cap core index, the advantage of the index itself is impressive. During the 37-year period, 1969 to 2006, the S&P 500 index fell into the bottom quartile in only two years and has not done so since 1979. The index has outpaced the average fund in 26 of the remaining 35 years, including 11 of the past 15 years. Its average ranking was in the 58th percentile, that is, outperforming 58% of the comparable actively managed funds, leading, as we shall see in the next chapter, to enormous superiority over time. It is hard to imagine that even a single one of the large-cap core equity funds has a similar record of consistency. Consistency matters. A fund that is good, or very good, in the vast majority of years produces a far larger long-term return than a fund that is superb in half of the years and a disaster in the remaining half. Single-year rankings, then, ignore the sheer arithmetic advantage of that consistency. In the coming chapters, the impact of that long-term consistency is cataloged over the past 25 years. I should add that these annual data are what we call survivor-biased, that is, that they exclude the records of the inevitably poorer-performing funds that regularly go out of business. As a result, this further understates the success of the market-owning index strategy. Investing in the first index mutual fund, $15,000 invested in 1976, value in 2006, $461,771. Much criticism has been heaped on the S&P 500 for its choice of stocks often picking new economy stocks, such as JDS Uniphase and Yahoo, near their inflated peak prices during the bubble, just before they crashed, taking on a growth bias at exactly the wrong time. While the criticism is valid, the excellent long-term record of the flawed index belies the existence of a significant problem. In fact, since the market peaked early in 2000, the S&P 500 has had only a single significantly subpar year, 2000, three years at about par, and three years, 2003, 2004, and 2006, in the top quartile of its peers. I can't imagine that the vast majority of money managers wouldn't have been ecstatic with such an outcome. Thus, the recent era has not only failed to erode, but nicely enhanced the lifetime record of the world's first index fund, now known as Vanguard 500 Index Fund. Let me be specific. At a dinner on September 20, 2006, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the fund's initial public offering, the counsel for the fund's underwriters reported that he had purchased 1,000 shares at the original offering price of $15 per share, a $15,000 investment. The value of his holding that evening 
including shares acquired through reinvesting the fund's dividends and distributions over the years, he proudly announced, was $461,771. Now there's a number that requires no comment. Well, maybe one comment. Of the 360 equity mutual funds then in existence, only 211 remain. This cumulative long-term winning record confirms that owning American business through a broadly diversified index fund is not only logical, but to say the least, incredibly productive. Equally important, it is consistent with the age-old principle expressed by Sir William of Ockham. Instead of joining the crowd of investors who try to gain an edge by dabbling in complex machinations involved in picking stocks and trying to outguess the stock market, two tasks that are inevitably fruitless for investors in the aggregate, choose the simplest of all solutions. Buy and hold the market portfolio. Don't take my word for it. Before you write off the value of the simple index fund solution, recognize that it has been adopted as a cornerstone of investment strategy for many of the nation's pension plans operated by our giant corporations and state and local governments. Indexing is also the predominant strategy for the largest of them all, the Retirement Plan for Federal Government Employees, the Federal Thrift Savings Plan. The plan has been a remarkable success and now holds some $173 billion of assets for the benefit of our public servants and members of uniformed services. Under the plan, the various government departments automatically make a contribution equal to 1% of annual pay and matching contributions of up to 5% of pay, meaning that a federal employee who contributes 5% of their salary to the plan receives a total matching contribution of 6%. All contributions and earnings are tax-deferred until withdrawal, much like the corporate 401k thrift plans. Overcoming what must have been some serious reservations, even the Bush administration determined to follow the federal thrift savings plan model in its plan for personal savings accounts as an optional alternative to our Social Security program. Indexing is also praised across the Atlantic pond. Listen to these words from Jonathan Davis columnist for the London Spectator. Nothing highlights better the continuing gap between rhetoric and substance in British financial services than the failure of providers here to emulate Jack Bogle's index fund success in the United States. Every professional in the city knows that index funds should be core building blocks in any long-term investor's portfolio. Since 1976, the Vanguard Index Fund has produced a compound annual return of 12% better than three-quarters of its peer group. Yet even 30 years on, ignorance and professional omerta still stand in the way of more investors enjoying the fruits of this unsung hero of the investment world. Chapter 4 Why Most Investors Lose to the Market The Relentless Rules of Humble Arithmetic Before we turn to the success of indexing as an investment strategy, let's explore in a bit more depth just why it is that investors as a group fail to earn the returns our corporations generate through their dividends and earnings growth, ultimately reflected in the long run in the prices of their stocks. To understand why they do not, we need only to recognize the simple mathematics of investing. All investors as a group must necessarily earn precisely the market return, but only before the costs of investing are deducted. After subtracting the costs of financial intermediation, all of those management fees, all of those brokerage commissions, all of those sales loads, all of those advertising costs, all of those operating costs. The returns of investors as a group must and will and do fall short of the market return by an amount precisely equal to the aggregate amount of those costs. In a market that returns 10%, we investors together earn a gross return of 10%. Duh! But after we pay our financial intermediaries, we pocket only what remains. And we pay them whether our returns are positive or negative. In investing, as a group, we get precisely what we don't pay for. So if we pay nothing, we get everything. There are, then, these two certainties. 1. Beating the market before costs is a zero-sum game. 2. Beating the market after costs is a loser's game. 
The returns earned by investors in the aggregate inevitably fall well short of the returns that are realized in our financial markets. How much do these costs come to? For individual investors holding stocks directly, trading costs average about 1.5% per year. That cost is lower, about 1%, for those who trade infrequently, and much higher for investors who trade frequently. For example, 3% for investors who turn their portfolios over at a rate above 200% per year. In equity mutual funds, management fees and operating expenses, combined, the expense ratio, average about 1.5% per year of fund assets. Then add, say, another 0.5% in sales charges, assuming that a 5% initial sales charge is spread over a 10-year holding period. If the shares are held for five years, the cost would be twice that figure, 1% per year. But then add a giant additional cost all the more pernicious by being invisible. I'm referring to the hidden cost of portfolio turnover, estimated at a full 1% per year. The average fund turns its portfolio over at a rate of about 100% per year, meaning that a $5 billion fund buys $5 billion of stocks each year and sells another $5 billion. At that rate, brokerage commissions, bid-ask spreads, and market impact costs add a major layer of additional costs. Result? The all-in cost of equity fund ownership can come to as much as 3% to 3.5% per year. I've ignored the hidden opportunity cost that fund investors pay. Most equity funds hold about 5% in cash reserves. If stocks earn a 10% return and these reserves earn 4%, that cost would add another 0.3% to the annual cost. 5% times the 6% differential in earnings. So yes, costs matter. The grim irony of investing, then, is that we investors as a group not only don't get what we pay for, we get precisely what we don't pay for. So if we pay nothing, we get everything. Let me illustrate this simple lesson with a wonderful quotation I came across a few years ago when I was rereading Other People's Money by Louis D. Brandeis, first published in 1914. Brandeis, later to become one of the most influential jurists in the history of the U.S. Supreme Court, railed against the oligarchs who a century ago controlled investment America and corporate America alike. Brandeis described their self-serving financial management and their interlocking interests as trampling with impunity on laws human and divine, obsessed with the delusion that two plus two make five. He predicted, accurately as it turned out, that the widespread speculation of that era would collapse, a victim of the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. He then added this unattributed warning. I'm guessing it's from Sophocles. Remember, O oh stranger, arithmetic is the first of the sciences and the mother of safety. Brandeis's words hit me like the proverbial ton of bricks. Why? Because the relentless rules of the arithmetic of investing are themselves so obvious. It's been said, by my detractors, that all I have going for me is the uncanny ability to recognize the obvious. The curious fact is that most investors either seem to have difficulty recognizing what lies in plain sight right before their eyes, or, perhaps even more pervasively, refuse to recognize the reality because it flies in the face of their deep-seated beliefs and their biases, their overconfidence, and their uncritical acceptance of the way that financial markets have worked seemingly forever. What is more, it is hardly in the interest of our financial intermediaries to encourage their investor clients to recognize the obvious reality. Indeed, the self-interest of the leaders of our financial system almost compels them to ignore these relentless rules. Paraphrasing Upton Sinclair, it's amazing how difficult it is for a man to understand something if he's paid a small fortune not to understand it. Our system of financial intermediation has created enormous fortunes for those in the field of managing other people's money. Their self-interest will not soon change. But as an investor, you must look after your own self-interest for only by facing the obvious realities of investing can the intelligent investor succeed. 
How much do the costs of financial intermediation matter? A ton. Indeed, the higher costs of equity funds have played the determinative role in explaining why fund managers have lagged the returns of the stock market itself so consistently for so long. When you think about it, how could it be otherwise? By and large, these managers are smart, well-educated, experienced, knowledgeable, and honest. But they are competing with each other. When one buys a stock, another sells it. There is no net gain to fund shareholders as a group. In fact, they incur a loss, a loss equal to the transaction costs they pay to those helpers that Mr. Buffett warned us about in Chapter 1. Investors pay far too little attention to the costs of investing. It's especially easy to underrate their importance under today's conditions. 1. When many costs are hidden from view, portfolio transaction costs, the unrecognized impact of front-end sales changes, taxes incurred on realized gains. 2. When stock market returns have been high, during the 1980s and 1990s, stock returns averaged 17.5% per year, and the average fund provided a non-trivial but clearly inadequate return of 15%. And especially, 3. When investors focus on short-term returns, ignoring the truly confiscatory impact of cost over an investment lifetime. Perhaps an example will help. Let's assume the stock market generates a total return averaging 8% per year over a half century. Yes, that's a long time, but an investment lifetime is now actually even longer. 65 or 70 years for an investor who goes to work at age 22 and begins to invest immediately and works until, say, age 65, and then continues to invest for an actuarial expectancy of 20 or more years thereafter. Now let's assume that the costs of the average mutual fund continue at their present rate of at least 2.5% per year. Result? A net annual return of just 5.5% for the average fund. $10,000 grows to $469,000, or $145,400. Where did that $323,600 go? Based on these assumptions, let's look at the returns earned on $10,000 over 50 years. The simple investment in the stock market grows to $469,000, a remarkable illustration of the magic of compounding returns over an investment lifetime. In the early years, growth at a 5.5% annual rate doesn't look all that different from the growth in the stock market itself. But ever so slowly, the rates begin to diverge, finally, truly dramatically. By the end of the long period, the value accumulated in the fund totals just $145,400, an astonishing shortfall of $323,600 to the cumulative return earned in the market itself. In the investment field, time doesn't heal all wounds. It makes them worse. Where returns are concerned, time is your friend. But where costs are concerned, time is your enemy. This point is powerfully illustrated when we consider how much of the value of the $10,000 investment is eroded with each passing year. By the end of the first year, only about 2% of the value of your capital has vanished, $10,800 versus $10,550. By the tenth year, 21% has vanished, $21,600 versus $17,100. By the thirtieth year, 50% has vanished, $100,600 versus $49,800. And by the end of the period, costs have consumed nearly 70% of the potential accumulation available simply by holding the market portfolio. The investor, who put up 100% of the capital and assumed 100% of the risk, earned but 31% of the market return. The system of financial intermediation, which put up 0% of the capital and assumed 0% of the risk, essentially confiscated 70% of that return, surely the lion's share. What we see here, and please don't ever forget it, is that over the long term, the miracle of compounding returns is overwhelmed by the tyranny of compounding costs.
Add that mathematical certainty to the relentless rules of humble arithmetic described earlier. But enough of theory and hypothetical examples. Let's see how this principle works in the real world. During the quarter century from 1980 to 2005, the return on the stock market itself, measured by the Standard & Poor's 500 index, averaged 12.5% per year. The return on the average mutual fund averaged just 10%. That 2.5% differential is about what one might have expected, given our earlier 3% rough estimate of fund costs. Never forget, market return minus cost equals investor return. Simply put, our fund managers sitting at the top of the investment food chain have confiscated an excessive share of the financial market's returns. Fund investors, inevitably at the bottom of the food chain, have been left with too small a share. Investors need not have incurred that loss, for they could have easily invested in a simple index fund tracking the S&P 500 index. Such a fund actually returned 12.3% per year during that period, the market return of 12.5% less costs of just 0.2%. That's an annual margin of superiority of 2.3% over the average fund. On first impression, that annual gap may not look large, but when compounded over 25 years, it reaches staggering proportions. A $10,000 initial investment in the index fund grew by a remarkable $170,800 compared to growth of just $98,200 in the average equity mutual fund only 57% of the total accumulation in the index fund. But let's face the facts. Both of these accumulations are overstated, for they are based on current $2,005, which have less than half the spending power they enjoyed in 1980. During this period, inflation eroded the real buying power of these returns at an average rate of 3.3% per year. When we turn those nominal dollars, the dollars that we earn and spend and invest every day, into real dollars, dollars that are adjusted to take inflation into account, the results for that original $10,000 investment tumble sharply. The cumulative real profit after compounding came to just $40,600 for the average actively managed equity fund, compared to $76,200 for the passively managed index fund. Now, the average fund produced barely one-half, actually 53%, of the profit earned by the stock market itself through the simple index fund, a return that was there for the taking. It's in the nature of arithmetic that deducting the same inflation rate from both figures further increases the comparative advantage of the investment with the higher return, in this case, the index fund. Yes, costs matter. Indeed, Costs make the difference between investment success and investment failure. In short, the humble arithmetic of investing, the logical, inevitable, and unyielding penalty assessed by investment costs and rising living costs, has devastated the returns earned by mutual fund investors. Using Justice Brandeis's formulation, our mutual fund managers seem obsessed with the delusion and are foisting that delusion on investors that a nominal gross return of 12.5% per year in the stock market, minus fund expenses of 2.5%, minus inflation of 3.3%, still equals a real net return of 12.5%. Well, to state the obvious, it doesn't. You can add and subtract for yourself. It equals, you guessed it, only 6.7%. Unless the fund industry changes and improves the net return it delivers to fund shareholders, it will falter and finally fail, a victim, yes, of the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. Were he looking over your shoulder as you read this book, just as Brandeis surely would be warning you, remember, O oh reader, that arithmetic is the first of the sciences and the mother of safety. So sharpen your pencils. Do your own arithmetic. Realize that you are not consigned to playing the hyperactive management game that is played by the overwhelming majority of individual investors and mutual fund owners alike. The index fund is there to guarantee 
that you will earn your fair share of whatever returns our businesses earn and our stock market delivers. Don't take my word for it. The innate superiority of the index fund has, perhaps grudgingly, been endorsed by at least a few mutual fund industry insiders. When he retired, here's Peter Lynch, the legendary manager who steered Fidelity Magellan Fund to such great success during his 1977 to 1990 tenure. The S&P is up 343.8% for 10 years. That is a four-bagger. The general equity funds are up 283%. So it's getting worse. The deterioration by professionals is getting worse. The public would be better off in an index fund. Now hear industry leader John Fossil, former chairman of the Investment Company Institute and of the Oppenheimer Funds. People ought to recognize that the average fund can never outperform the market in total. Even hyperactive investors seem to believe in indexing strategies. Here's what James J. Kramer, money manager and host of CNBC's Mad Money says. After a lifetime of picking stocks, I have to admit that Bogle's arguments in favor of the index fund have me thinking of joining him rather than trying to beat him. Bogle's wisdom and common sense are indispensable for anyone trying to figure out how to invest in this crazy stock market. And hedge fund managers, too, join the chorus. One of the industry's giants, Clifford A. Asnes, manager and founding principal of AQR Capital Management, adds his own wisdom, expertise, and integrity. Market cap-based indexing will never be driven from its deserved perch as core and deserved king of the investment world. It is what we should all own in theory, and it has delivered low-cost equity returns to a great mass of investors the now and forever king of the hill. Chapter 5 The Grand Illusion Surprise! The returns reported by mutual funds aren't actually earned by mutual fund investors. It's gratifying that industry insiders such as the ICI's Mr. Fossil, Fidelity's Mr. Lynch, Mad Money's Mr. Kramer, and AQR's Mr. Asnes agree with me about the inevitable inadequacy of returns earned by the equity mutual fund relative to the returns available simply by owning the stock market itself through an index fund based on the S&P 500. But the idea that fund investors actually earn those returns proves to be a grand illusion. Not only an illusion, but a generous one. The reality is, in fact, considerably worse. For in addition to those heavy costs that fund managers extract from their shareholders, the shareholders themselves pay a second, additional cost that has been even larger. During the 25-year period that we examined in the previous chapter, the returns we showed were based on the traditional time-weighted returns reported by the funds themselves, the change in the asset value of each fund share, adjusted to reflect the reinvestment of all income dividends and capital gains distributions. But that return does not tell us what return was earned by the average fund investor, and it turns out to be far lower. To ascertain the return earned by the average fund investor, we must consider not only the time-weighted return, but also consider the dollar-weighted return, which accounts for the impact of capital flows from investors into and out of the fund. For example, if a $100 million fund earns a return of 30% during a given year and $1 billion of its shares are purchased during the final day of the year, the average return earned by its investors would be just 5.4%. Hint, money comes into most funds after good performance is achieved and goes out when bad performance follows. When we compare traditionally calculated fund returns with the returns actually earned by their investors over the past quarter century, it turns out that the average fund investor earned not the 10% earned by the average fund, but 7.3%, an annual return fully 2.7 percentage points per year less than that of the average fund. In fairness, the index fund investor, too, was enticed by the rising market and earned a return of 10.8%. 1.5 percentage points short of the fund return itself. Yes, 
During the past 25 years, while the stock market index fund was providing an annual return of 12.3% and the average equity fund was earning an annual return of 10%, the average fund investor was earning only 7.3% a year. Compounded over the full period, as we saw in the previous chapter, the 2.5% penalty incurred by the average fund because of costs was huge. But the dual penalties of faulty timing and adverse selection were even larger. From 1980 to 2005, $10,000 invested in the index fund grew to $170,800. In the average equity fund, to $98,200 just 57% of what was there for the taking. But the compound return earned by the average fund investor tumbled to $48,200, a stunning 28% of the return on the simple index fund. And once again, the values of all those dollars tumble when, as we must, we take inflation into account. The index fund real return drops to 9% per year, but the real return of the average fund investor plummets to just 4%. On a compounded basis, $76,200 of real value for the index fund versus just $16,700 for the fund investor. Only 22% of the potential accumulation that was there for the taking. Truth told, it's hard to imagine such a staggering gap, but facts are facts. Please be clear that while the data clearly indicate that fund investor returns fell well short of fund returns, there is no way to be precise about the exact shortfall. We estimated the gap based on the difference between the 10-year time-weighted returns on the 200 largest mutual funds in 1999 and their actual dollar-weighted returns during the same period. But the point of this statistical examination of the returns earned by the stock market, the average fund, and the average fund owner is not precision, but direction. Whatever the precise data, the evidence is compelling that equity fund returns lag the stock market by a substantial amount, largely accounted for by their costs, and that fund investor returns lag fund returns by an even larger amount. What explains this shocking lag? Simply put, counterproductive market timing and fund selection First, shareholders investing in equity funds paid a heavy timing penalty. They invested too little of their savings in equity funds during the 1980s and early 1990s when stocks represented good values. Then, inflamed by the heady optimism and greed of the era, and enticed by the wiles of mutual fund marketers as the bull market neared its peak, they poured too much of their savings into equity funds. Second, they paid a selection penalty pouring their money into the market not only at the wrong time, but into the wrong funds. This lag effect was amazingly pervasive. In the past decade, for example, the returns actually provided to investors by 198 of the 200 most popular equity funds were actually lower than the returns that they reported to investors. This lag was especially evident during the new economy craze of the late 1990s. Then, the fund industry organized more and more funds, usually funds that carried considerably higher risk than the stock market itself, and magnified the problem by heavily advertising the eye-catching past returns earned by its hottest funds. As the market soared, investors poured even larger sums of money into equity funds. They invested a net total of only $18 billion in 1990 when stocks were cheap, but $420 billion in 1999 and 2000, when stocks were overvalued. What's more, they also chose overwhelmingly the highest risk growth funds, to the virtual exclusion of more conservative, value-oriented funds. While only 20% of their money went into risky, aggressive growth funds in 1990, fully 95% went into such funds during their peak years of 1999 to 2000. After the fall, when it was too late, their purchases dried up to as little as $50 billion in 2002, when the market hit bottom. They also pulled their money out of growth funds and turned, too late, to value funds. 
The problem can be illustrated by observing the experience of the most popular growth funds of five giant fund families with the largest cash inflows. Altogether, more than $150 billion in 1996 to 2000 inclusive. During those five years, these aggressive funds provided spectacular records, annual returns averaging 21% per year, well above even the outstanding return of 18.4% on the S&P 500 index fund. But during the five years that followed, in 2001 to 2005, retribution followed. While the index fund eked out a small gain, less than 1% per year, the returns of these aggressive, risk-laden funds tumbled into negative territory. For the full 10 years, taking into account both their rise and their fall, the returns reported by these aggressive funds were actually quite acceptable an average of 7.8% per year, nearly equal to the return of 9.1% for the index fund. But woe to the shareholder who chose them. For while the fund returns were acceptable, the returns of their shareholders were, well, terrible. Their average return came to minus 0.4% per year, in negative territory, and a lag of fully 8.3 percentage points behind the fund's reported per share figure. For the record, the annual return of the index fund shareholder at 7.1% also lagged the return of the fund itself, but by only two percentage points, far less than this group's gap of 8.3 percentage points, or even the industry gap of 2.7 percentage points. When the annual returns of these aggressive funds are compounded over the full period, the deterioration is stunning. A cumulative fund return averaging more than 112%, a cumulative shareholder return averaging negative 4.5%. That's a lag of more than 117 percentage points. This astonishing penalty, then, makes clear the perils of fund selection and timing. It also illustrates the value of indexing and the necessity of setting a sound course and then sticking to it, come what may. The shocking performance of fund investors during the stock market new economy bubble is unusual in its dimension, but not in its existence. Fund investors have been chasing past performance since time eternal, allowing their emotions, perhaps even their greed, to overwhelm their reason. But the fund industry itself has played on these emotions, bringing out new funds to meet the fads and fashions of the day, often supercharged and speculative and then aggressively advertising and marketing them. It is fair to say that whenever counterproductive investor emotions are played on by ever counterproductive fund industry promotions, little good is apt to result. The fund industry will not soon give up its promotions, but the intelligent investor will be well advised to heed not only the message in Chapter 4 about minimizing expenses, but the message in this chapter about getting emotions out of the equation. The beauty of the index fund, then, lies not only in its low expenses, but in the fact that it eliminates all those tempting fund choices that promise so much and deliver so little. The index fund, on the other hand, can be held through thick and thin for an investment lifetime, and emotions need never enter the equation. The winning formula for success in investing is owning the entire stock market through an index fund and then doing nothing. Just stay the course. Don't take my word for it. The wise Warren Buffett shares my view in what I call his four E's. The greatest enemies of the equity investor are expenses and emotions. Even Andrew Lowe, MIT professor and author of A Non-Random Walk Down Wall Street, suggesting strategies to outperform the market, personally invest by buying and holding index funds. Perhaps even more surprisingly, even the founder and chief executive of the largest mutual supermarket, vigorously promoting actively managed funds, favors the classic index fund. When asked why people invest in managed funds, Charles Schwab answered, it's fun to play around. It's human nature to try to select the right horse. But for the average person, I'm more of an indexer. The predictability is so high. For 10, 15, 20 years, 
you'll be in the 85th percentile of performance. Why would you screw it up? Mark Holbert, highly regarded editor of the Holbert Financial Digest, concurs. Assuming that the future is like the past, you can outperform 80% of your fellow investors over the next several decades by investing in an index fund and doing nothing else. But acquire the discipline to do something even better. Become a long-term index fund investor. His New York Times article was headlined, Buy and Hold? Sure, but don't forget the hold. Chapter 6 Taxes are costs, too. Don't forget Uncle Sam. We aren't yet quite through with the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. The logical, inevitable, and unyielding long-term penalties assessed against stock market participants by investment expenses and the powerful impact of inflation. Together, they have slashed the capital accumulated by mutual fund investors. The index fund has provided excellent protection from the penalty of costs, as we have just seen in Chapter 4. While its real returns, too, were hurt by inflation, the cumulative impact was far less than on the actively managed equity funds. But there is yet another cost, too often ignored, that slashes the net returns that investors actually receive even further. I'm referring to taxes, federal, state, and local income taxes. Note, about one-half of all equity mutual fund shares are held by individual investors in fully taxable investment accounts. The other half are held in tax-deferred accounts, such as individual retirement accounts, IRAs, and corporate savings, thrift, and profit-sharing plans. If your fund holdings are solely in the latter category, you need not be concerned with the discussion in this chapter. And here again, the index fund garners a substantial edge. The fact is that managed mutual funds are astonishingly tax inefficient, a result of the short-term focus of their portfolio managers, usually frenetic traders of the stocks in the portfolios they supervise. The turnover of the average equity fund now comes to about 100% per year. In fairness, based on total assets rather than number of funds, the turnover rate of actively managed funds is 61%. Industry-wide, the average stock is held by the average fund for an average of just 12 months, 20 months based on equity fund total assets. Hard as it is to imagine, during 1945 to 1965, the turnover rate averaged just 16% per year, an average holding period of six years for the average stock in a fund portfolio. As we have already seen, the huge increase in turnover and in its attendant transaction costs have ill-served fund investors. This pattern of tax inefficiency for active managers seems destined to continue so long as a. stocks rise and b. Fund managers continue their hyperactive patterns of short-term trading. Let's be clear. Once focused on long-term investment, fund managers are now focused on short-term speculation. But the index fund is precisely the opposite, buying and holding forever, and incurring transaction costs that are somewhere between zero and infinitesimal. So let's pick up where we left off two chapters ago with the net annual return of 10% for the average equity fund over the past 25 years, compared with the 12.3% return for the S&P 500 index fund. With the high portfolio turnover of actively managed funds, their taxable investors were subject to an estimated effective annual federal tax of 1.8 percentage points per year. State and local taxes would further balloon the figure reducing the after-tax annual return to 8.2%. Despite the higher returns that they earned, investors in the index fund were actually subjected to lower taxes. In fact, at 0.6 percentage points, only about one-third of that tax burden, bringing their after-tax return to 11.7%. Compounded, the initial $10,000 investment grew by just $61,700 after taxes for the active funds, nearly 60% less than the $149,000 of accumulated growth in the index fund. 
Yes, the index fund investor would be subject to taxes on any gains realized when he liquidates his shares. But for an investor who bequeaths shares to his heirs, the cost would be stepped up and no gain would be recognized nor taxed. What's more, just as fund expenses are paid in current dollars, so is your annual tax bill. When we calculate the accumulated wealth in terms of real dollars with 1980 buying power, investor wealth again contracts dramatically. The annual real return of the average equity fund now drops to 4.9 percent, less than half of the 8.4 percent actual return of the index fund. Compounded, the real after-tax accumulation on that initial $10,000 came to $65,100 for the index fund, nearly three times the $23,100 for the active equity index fund. Even with the more subdued returns earned in the post-bubble era, actively managed funds persist in foisting this extraordinarily costly tax inefficiency on their shareholders. While the net annual return of the average equity fund was 8.5% over the past decade, 1996 to 2005, the tax bill consumed fully 1.7 percentage points of the return, reducing the net fund return to just 6.8 percent. I hesitate to assign the responsibility for being the straw that broke the camel's back of equity fund returns to any single one of these negative factors, but surely the final straws include 1. High costs, 2. The adverse investor selections and counterproductive market timing described in the previous chapter. And three, taxes. Perhaps it doesn't matter. The camel's back is surely broken. But the last straw, it turns out, is inflation. When we pay our fund costs in current dollars year after year, and that's exactly how we pay our fund expenses and our taxes on fund capital gains, often realized on a short-term basis to boot, and yet accumulate our assets only in real dollars, eroded by the relentless rise in the cost of living that seems embedded in our economy, the results are devastating. It is truly remarkable, and hardly praiseworthy, that this devastation is virtually ignored in the information that fund managers provide to fund investors. A Paradox While the index fund is remarkably tax-efficient in terms of managing capital gains, it turns out to be relatively tax inefficient in terms of distributing dividend income. Why? Because its rock-bottom costs mean that nearly all of the dividends paid on the stocks held by the index fund actually flow directly into the hands of the index fund shareholders. On the other hand, with the high expense ratios incurred by managed funds, only a tiny portion of the dividends the funds receive actually find their way into the hands of the fund's shareholders. Here is the unsurprising and ever-relentless arithmetic. The annual gross dividend yield earned by the typical active equity fund, before deducting fund expenses, is about the same as the dividend yield of the low-cost index fund, 1.8% in mid-2006. But since the typical active fund bears an expense ratio of 1.5%, it confiscates fully 80% of its dividend income, a reaffirmation of the eternal position of fund investors at the bottom of the mutual fund food chain. The result? A net dividend yield of just 0.3% for its owners. On the other hand, the expense ratio of a low-cost index fund is about 0.15%, consuming only 8% of its 1.8% dividend yield. The result? a net yield of 1.65% to distribute to the passively managed index fund owners, a dividend merely five and a half times as high as the dividend on the actively managed fund. Yes, for taxable shareholders, that larger dividend is subject to the current 15% tax on dividend income, consuming about 0.27 percentage points of the yield. Paradoxically, the active fund with an effective tax rate of just 0.045%, 15% of the 0.3% net yield, appears more tax efficient from a dividend standpoint. But the reality is that the tax imposed by the active managers in the form of the fees it deducts before paying those dividends 
has already consumed 80% of the yield. Surely the wise investor will seek the dividend tax inefficiency of the index fund rather than the tax efficiency engendered by the confiscatory operating costs of most actively managed funds. Don't take my word for it. Consider these words from a paper by John B. Chauvin of Stanford University and the National Bureau of Economic Research and Joel M. Dixon, then of the Federal Reserve System. Mutual funds have failed to manage their realized capital gains in such a way as to permit a substantial deferral of taxes, raising investors' tax bills considerably. If the Vanguard 500 index fund could have deferred all of its realized capital gains, it would have ended up in the 91.8 percentile for the high-tax investor, that is, outpaced 92 percent of other equity funds. Or listen again to investment advisor William Bernstein, author of The Four Pillars of Investing. While it is probably a poor idea to own actively managed mutual funds in general, it is truly a terrible idea to own them in taxable accounts. Taxes are a drag on performance of four percentage points each year. Many index funds allow your capital gains to grow largely undisturbed until you sell. For the taxable investor, indexing means never having to say you're sorry. And Dr. Malkiel again casts his lot with the index fund. Index funds are tax-friendly, allowing investors to defer the realization of capital gains or avoid them completely if the shares are later bequeathed. To the extent that the long-run uptrend in stock prices continues, switching from security to security involves realizing capital gains that are subject to tax. Taxes are a crucially important financial consideration because the earlier realization of capital gains will substantially reduce net returns. Index funds do not trade from security to security and thus they tend to avoid capital gains taxes. Chapter 7 Returns during the past 25 years were far above long-term norms. What happens if future returns are lower? Let me begin by reminding you of the unfailing principle that I described in Chapter 2. In the long run, it is the reality of business, the dividend yields and earnings growth of America's corporations, that drives the returns generated by our stock markets. As a result, I must warn you that the 12.5% nominal annual return provided by the U.S. stock market during the past 25 years, the period that I have examined in the three preceding chapters, was far above the century-long historical norm of about 9.5%. Recall that the century-plus nominal investment return earned by stocks was 9.5%, consisting of an average dividend yield of 4.5%, an average annual earnings growth of 5%. A mere 0.1% per year, what I described as speculative return, was added by the rise in the price-earnings ratio from 15 times at the beginning of the period to 18 times at its end, bringing the total annual return to 9.6%. Paradoxically, the investment return earned by stocks over the past 25 years was hardly extraordinary. A dividend yield averaging 3.4%, plus annual earnings growth of 6.4%, brought it to 9.8%, almost precisely equal to the historical norm of 9.5%. But illustrating the difficulty of forecasting changes in the amount that investors are willing to pay for each dollar of corporate earnings, the speculative return was anything but normal. As investor confidence rose, so did the price-earnings ratio rise, from 9 times to 18 times, an amazing 100% increase, adding fully 2.7 percentage points per year, fully 30% to the solid 9.8% fundamental return. Early in 2000, the price-earnings ratio had actually risen to an astonishing 32 times, only to plummet to 18 times as the new economy bubble burst. Result? Speculative return was responsible for more than 20% of the market's 12.5% annual return during this period. Since we can't realistically expect the P.E. ratio to double in the years immediately ahead, we can't expect a similar 12.5% return to recur. 
it seems clear that we're facing an era of subdued returns in the stock market. Why? First, because today's dividend yield on stocks is not 4.5%, the historical rate, but slightly below 2%. Thus, we can expect a deadweight loss of 2.5 percentage points per year in the contribution of dividend income to investment return. Then let's assume that corporate earnings continue, as over time they usually do, to grow at about the pace of our economy's expected nominal growth rate of 5 or 6 percent per year over the coming decade. Footnote. A more than technical caveat. Due to the issuance of additional shares of stock by corporations over the years, the rate of growth of corporate earnings per share is estimated to lag the growth of aggregate corporate earnings by as much as two percentage points per year. If that's correct, then the most likely investment return on stocks would be in the range of seven to eight percent. Let's be optimistic and project a return, a bit nervously, of eight percent. Second, the present price earnings multiple on stocks looks to be about 18 times based on the trailing 12-month reported earnings of the Standard & Poor's 500 index, 16 times if we use projected operating earnings, which exclude write-offs for discontinued business activities. If it remains at that level a decade hence, speculative return would neither add to nor detract from that possible 8% investment return. My guess, it is little more than that, is that the P.E. might ease down to, say, 16 times, reducing the market's return by about one percentage point a year to an annual rate of 7%. You don't have to agree with me. If you think it will leap to 25 times, add three percentage points, bringing the total return on stocks to 11%. If you think it will drop to 12 times, subtract four percentage points, reducing the total return to 4%. If rational expectations suggest future annual return of about 7% on stocks, what do rational expectations suggest about returns on equity funds? Let's assume that 7% is a rational expectation for future stock market returns. Now, let's calculate the return for the average actively managed equity mutual fund in such an environment. Let me remind you of the arithmetic. Nominal return minus cost at past levels minus taxes, reduced to reflect lower capital gains realization, minus an assumed inflation rate of 2.5%, the rate the financial markets are now expecting over the coming decade, equals just 1.2% per year. I simply didn't have the courage to make another deduction to reflect the impact of the counterproductive timing and adverse fund selection that will likely continue to be double the typical fund shareholder. It may seem absurd to project such a low return for the typical equity fund investor, but the numbers are there. Again, feel free to disagree and to project the future using your own rational expectations. Let me summarize why the future outlook for stock returns is so far below the long-term real return on U.S. stocks of about 6.5% annually since 1900. My projection of a future real return of 4.5% before costs and taxes, is conservative largely because today's dividend yield of 2% is below the long-term norm of 4.5%, partially offset by my optimistic projection of real earnings growth of 2.5% per year versus the 1.5% long-term norm. Yes, the real long-term rate of per-share earnings growth of U.S. corporations has been no more than that humble figure. In fact, as suggested earlier in this chapter, some experts put the figure at only 1% on an earnings per share basis. In any event, in a future environment of lower returns on equities that I believe is all too likely, the low-cost, tax-efficient index fund would provide even better relative real returns relative to actively managed equity funds than the enormous advantage it achieved over the past quarter century, as illustrated in earlier chapters. Yes, a real 10-year gain of $4,800 on a $10,000 investment in the index fund is nothing to write home about. But what's to be said about the mere $1,300 profit that could well be what the typical managed equity fund delivers? The fact is that lower returns harshly magnify the relentless arithmetic of excessive mutual fund costs, 
even ignoring all of those unnecessary taxes. Why? While costs of 2.5 percentage points would consume only 16% of a 15% return and only 25% of a 10% return, such costs would consume nearly 40% of a 7% nominal return and, I hope you're sitting down, nearly 60% of the 4.5% real return on stocks that rational expectations suggest. Unless the fund industry begins to change, reducing management fees, operating expenses, sales charges, and portfolio turnover and its attendant costs, the typical actively managed fund would appear to be a singularly unfortunate investment choice. Clearly, the 1.2% expected annual real return that the average equity fund might deliver is unacceptable. What can equity fund investors do to avoid being trapped by these relentless rules of humble arithmetic, so devastating when applied to future returns that are likely to be well below long-term norms? There are at least these five options to improve on it. 1. Select winning funds on the basis of their long-term past records. 2. Select winning funds on the basis of their recent short-term performance. 3. Get some professional advice in selecting funds that are likely to outpace the market. 4. Select funds with rock-bottom costs and minimal portfolio turnover and no sales loads. 5. Select a low-cost index fund that simply holds the stock market portfolio. In the next five chapters, We'll examine each of these options. Don't take my word for it. Financial advisors seem to agree with my appraisal of future returns. In the latter part of 2006, in a speech before these professionals at their Chicago convention, I polled the audience. The clear consensus, stock returns of 6.5% over the coming decade. Investment bankers are of a similar mind. When Henry McVeigh market strategist for Morgan Stanley, polled the chief financial officers of America's 100 largest corporations, they expected a future return on stocks of 6.6%. One wonders how these executives can justify their implicit assumption that the stocks in their company's pension plans will return more than 11% per year. Other highly regarded investment strategists also share my general view that we are facing a new era of subdued investment returns. Gary P. Brinson, CFA, former president of UBS Investment Management, is one whose assessment about future returns echoes my own. Today's investment market fundamentals and financial variables clearly suggest that future real returns from a mixed portfolio of stocks, bonds, and other assets, such as real estate, are unlikely to be greater than 4.5 to 5 percent. With an inflation assumption of 2.5 percent, Nominal returns greater than 7 to 7.5 percent for these portfolios are unrealistic. What cannot be explained is why people are willing to pay the considerable fees involved. Perhaps they are paying for historical returns, for hope, or out of desperation. For the markets in total, the amount of value added, or alpha, must sum to zero. One person's positive alpha is someone else's negative alpha. Collectively, for the institutional, mutual fund, and private banking arenas, the aggregate alpha return will be zero or negative after transaction costs. Aggregate fees for the active managers should thus be, at most, the fees associated with passive management. Yet, these fees are several times larger than fees that would be associated with passive management. This illogical conundrum will ultimately have to end. Or consider these words by Richard M. Ennis, CFA, Ennis Nupp & Associates, and editor of the Financial Analyst Journal. Today, with interest rates near 4% and stocks yielding less than 2%, few among us expect double-digit investment returns for any extended period in the near future. Yet we live with a legacy of that era. Historically high fee structures brought on by trillions upon trillions of dollars seeking growth during the boom in shelter in its aftermath. Second, facing the dual challenge of market efficiency and high costs, investors will continue to shift assets from active to passive management. And third, 
some of active management's true believers will shift assets from expensive products to more reasonably priced products. Impetus for this move will be the growing realization that high fees sap the performance potential of even skillful managers. Chapter 8 Selecting Long-Term Winners Don't look for the needle, just buy the haystack. Selecting winning funds in advance is more difficult than it looks. Sure, there are always some winners that survive over the years. And if we pour over records of past performance, it is easy to find them. The mutual funds we hear the most about are those that have lit up the skies with their glow of past success. We don't hear much about those that did well for a while, even for a long while, and then faltered. And when they falter, they often go out of business, consigned to the dustbin of mutual fund history. But easy as it is to select past winners, there is little evidence that performance persists. Let's begin by considering the records of funds that have won over the long term. That seems like a good place to begin, so let's see how it has worked in practice. We'll go back to 1970 and examine the 36-year records of the 355 equity funds that existed all those years ago. The first and most obvious surprise awaits you. Fully 223 of those funds, almost two-thirds, have gone out of business. If your fund doesn't last for the long term, how on earth can you invest for the long term? We can assume that it was not the best performers that have gone to their well-earned demise. The fact is that it was the laggards that disappeared. Sometimes their managers moved on. The average portfolio manager, in fact, lasts just five years. Sometimes giant financial conglomerates acquired their management companies, and the new owners decided to clean up the product line. These conglomerates, truth told, are in business primarily to earn a return on their capital, not a return on your, the fund investor's capital. Often, funds with lagging performance saw their investors flee, and they became a drag on their manager's profits. There are lots of reasons that funds disappear, few of them good. A death in the family, funds that falter, and funds that fail. Even funds with solid long-term records go out of business. Often their management companies are acquired by large marketing companies whose ambitious executives simply conclude that, however good the fund's early records, they are not exciting enough to draw huge amounts of capital from new investors. They have simply outlived their usefulness. In other cases, a few years of faltering performance does the job. Sadly, one of the more recent victims of these attitudes was the second oldest fund in the entire mutual fund industry, one that had survived through all of the tempestuous markets of the past 80 years. State Street Investment Trust, 1925 to 2005. Rest in peace. As one of the longest serving participants in the fund industry, who clearly remembers the classy record of this fund over so many years, I regard the loss of State Street as a death in the family. In any event, 223 of the equity funds of 1970 are gone, mostly the poor performers. Another 60 remain, yet significantly underperform the S&P 500 by more than one percentage point per year. Together then, 283 funds, nearly 80 percent of the funds among those original 355, have, one way or another, failed to distinguish themselves. Another 48 funds provided returns within one percentage point, plus or minus, of the return of the S&P 500. So let's call them market matchers. That leaves just 24 mutual funds, only one out of every 14, that outpace the market by more than one percentage point per year. Let's face it, those odds are terrible. What's more, the margin of superiority of 15 of those 24 funds over the S&P 500 was less than two percentage points per year, a superiority that may be due as much to luck as to skill. That still leaves us with nine solid long-term winners. Believe me, it is a tremendous accomplishment to outpace the market by two percentage points or more of annual return over 35 years. Make no mistake about that. But here a curious, perhaps almost obvious fact emerges. 
six of those nine winners achieved their superiority many years ago, often when they were of small size. Years ago, the accomplishments of these nine successful mutual funds were noticed by investors. Cash poured in, and they got large. But, as Warren Buffett reminds us, a fat wallet is the enemy of superior returns. And so it was. As they grew, the records of six of them turned lackluster. One fund, in fact, reached its performance peak way back in 1982, 24 long years ago. On balance, it has lagged ever since. Two others peaked in 1983. The remaining three peaked no more recently than 1993, more than a decade ago. One of these was Peter Lynch's legendary Fidelity Magellan Fund, which has now been struggling for 13 years. That leaves just three funds. The fact is that only one out of every 120 equity funds that started the race in 1970 only eight-tenths of one percent of the total have survived and mounted a record of sustained excellence. I now salute them by name. Davis New York Venture, Fidelity Contra Fund, and Franklin Mutual Shares. Hail to the victors! Significantly, while the portfolio managers for these three funds have changed over the years, the frequency of change has been tiny. Succeeding his father, Shelby C. Davis, Chris Davis has managed the Davis Fund since 1991, since 1996 with Kenneth Feinberg. Will Danoff has been the lead manager of Fidelity Contra Fund ever since 1990, and Michael Price managed Franklin until 1997, followed by a successor who ran the fund until 2005. But before you rush out to invest in these three funds with such truly remarkable long-term records, Think about the next 35 years. Think about the odds that they will continue to outperform. Think about their present size. Think about the fact that within that time frame, they are all virtually certain to have at least several new managers. Think, too, about the odds that these funds will even exist 35 years hence. It's a changing and competitive world out there in mutual fund land, and I wish these managers and the shareholders of the funds they run the very best of luck. Conspicuous by its absence from this list of winning funds, of course, is Leg Mason Value Trust, managed since its 1982 inception by legendary investment professional supreme Bill Miller. Since the fund did not begin operations until 1982, it is not on my list, but it provides several lessons about fund performance. Miller, something of a contrarian, is the only manager in the past four decades to outperform the S&P 500 for a truly remarkable 15 consecutive years, 1991 to 2005 inclusive. Despite his great ability, the ever-humble Miller would be, I think, the first to agree with Stephen Jay Gould's tenet that long streaks are extraordinary luck imposed on great skill. Just as was the case with Joe DiMaggio's remarkable 56-game hitting streak in baseball, the longer Miller's streak extended, the more attention it got, and the more investor dollars flowed into the fund. But by the autumn of 2006, his streak seemed destined to come to an end, even as did the streak of the Yankee Clipper. The year is not yet out, so no predictions. With the S&P 500 up 7.3% by September, Leg Mason value was actually down 4.9%, putting something of a dent in the long-term record. Through 2005, the fund's annual rate of return had averaged 15.3% per year, compared to 12.9% for the S&P 500 index fund, a nice annual edge of 2.4 percentage points. But by September 2006, the gap had shrunk to 1.8 percentage points with an annual time-weighted return averaging 14.6%, compared to 12.8% for the index. Unsurprisingly, the major inflows of investor capital did not begin until 1997, the seventh year of the streak. So the dollar-weighted annual return earned by Leg Mason Value shareholders was a sharply lower 10.3% that was far below its time-weighted return and also well below the index return. Is Miller's reversion toward and then below the market mean temporary 
or enduring? Will the fund be afflicted with the same malaise that afflicted six of those nine long-term winners we just discussed? Or is it merely a brief interval of bad luck? Who can know? Whatever the case, please remember that the odds in favor of owning a consistently successful equity fund were less than one out of a hundred. However one slices and dices the data, there can be no question that funds with long-serving portfolio managers and records of consistent excellence are the exception rather than the rule in the mutual fund industry. The simple fact, using Cervantes' wonderful observation, selecting a mutual fund that will outpace the stock market itself over the long term is like looking for a needle in the haystack. I offer you Bogle's corollary. Don't look for the needle in the haystack. Just buy the haystack. The haystack, of course, is the entire stock market portfolio, readily available through a low-cost index fund. The return of such a fund would have roughly matched or exceeded the returns of 346 of the 355 funds that began the 35-year competition that I described at the start of this chapter. And I see no reason that the same fund cannot achieve a roughly commensurate achievement in the years to come. Not through any ledger domain, but merely through the relentless rules of humble arithmetic that you now must know so well. We know that the index fund will deliver substantially all of the stock market's return, but with all the fund manager changes that will inevitably be forthcoming for actively managed funds, with all the funds that will die, with the successful funds drawing capital in amounts that will preclude their future success, and with our inability to be certain how much of a fund's performance is based on luck and how much on skill, there is simply no way to assure success by picking the funds that will best suit us, even by looking to their past performance over the long term. In fund performance, the past is rarely prologue. Don't take my word for it. Need more advice? With his customary wisdom, Paul Samuelson sums up the difficulty of selecting superior managers in this parable. Suppose it was demonstrated that one out of twenty alcoholics could learn to become a moderate social drinker. The experienced clinician would answer, even if true, act as if it were false, for you will never identify that one in twenty, and in the attempt, five in twenty will be ruined. Investors should forsake the search for such tiny needles in huge haystacks. In the Wall Street Journal, long-time getting-going columnist Jonathan Clements asks, Can you pick the winners? The answer? Even fans of actively managed funds often concede that most other investors would be better off in index funds. But buoyed by abundant self-confidence, these folks aren't about to give up on actively managed funds themselves. A tad delusional? I think so. Picking the best-performing funds is like trying to predict the dice before you roll them down the craps table, says an investment advisor in Boca Raton, Florida. I can't do it. The public can't do it. Still, I figure we shouldn't discourage fans of actively managed funds. With all of their buying and selling, active investors ensure the market is reasonably efficient. That makes it possible for the rest of us to do the sensible thing, which is to index. Want to join me in this parasitic behavior? To build a well-diversified portfolio, you might stash 70% of your stock portfolio in a Wilshire 5000 index fund and the remaining 30% in an international index fund. If these comments don't persuade you about the hazards of focusing on past returns of mutual funds, just believe what fund organizations tell you. Every single firm in the fund industry acknowledges my conclusion that past fund performance is of no help in projecting the future returns of mutual funds. In every mutual fund prospectus, in every sales promotional folder, and in every mutual fund advertisement, albeit in print almost too small to read, the following warning appears. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Believe it. Chapter 9 The Futility of Chasing Short-Term Performance Fooled by Randomness The title of a provocative book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb In selecting mutual funds, however, 
most fund investors seem to rely not on sustained performance over the long term, but on exciting performance over the short term. Chapter 5 reinforces this point. Studies show that 95% of all investor dollars flow to funds rated 4 or 5 stars by Morningstar, the statistical service most broadly used by investors in evaluating fund returns. These star ratings are based on a composite of a fund's record over the previous 3, 5, and 10-year periods. For younger funds, the ratings may cover as few as 3 years. As a result, the previous two years' performance alone accounts for 35% of the rating of a fund with 10 years of history and 66% for a fund in business for from 3 to 5 years, a heavy bias in favor of recent returns. How successful are fund choices based on the stars awarded on the basis of such short-term achievements? Not very. According to investment analyst Mark Holbert, a mutual fund portfolio continuously adjusted to hold only Morningstar's four- and five-star funds earned an annual return of just 6.9 percent during 1994 to 2004, nearly 40 percent below the 11 percent return on the total U.S. stock market index. In fairness, Morningstar changed the basis for its rating system to reflect performance versus peers with similar objectives rather than funds as a group. The relative performance of the four- and five-star funds has improved since then. To make matters worse, according to Holbert, these highly rated funds were assuming even more risk than the market itself. Average monthly volatility and asset value, 16% for the funds compared to 15% for the stock market. The first shall be last. Sadly, the orientation of fund investors toward recent short-term returns works worst in strong bull markets. Consider the example of the top 10 performers among the 851 equity funds in operation during the great new economy market bubble of 1997 to 1999. A wondrous group they were. Focused on Internet, telecom, and technology stocks, these funds generated an average return of 55% per year during the upswing, a cumulative return of 279% for the full three years. Remarkable. Well, you can guess what came next. The bubble burst, and one by one, just as the good book warned, the first shall be last. Really? Over the next three years, 2000 to 2002 inclusive, Every one of the original top 10 funds plummeted into the bottom 60, with not a single fund in the original top 10 ranked higher than number 790. Fund number 9 on the upside actually was last, number 851 on the downside. Fund number 1 dropped in rank to number 841. Fund number 2 dropped to number 832. And fund number 3 tumbled to number 845. On average, the one-time 10 top funds in the bull market were outperformed by 95% of their peers in the bear market that followed. For investors who believed that the past would be prologue, it was not a pretty result. Please remember that even a single annual gain of 55% followed by a loss of 34% doesn't leave the investor with a 21% gain. More like 2%. Do the arithmetic. And with three years of average annual gains of 55% on the upside and annual losses averaging 34% on the downside, it was much worse. These aggressive new economy funds ended up with a cumulative positive return averaging 13% for the full six-year period, a far cry from the S&P 500's cumulative gain of 30%. Yet while that return was not particularly satisfactory in terms of the traditional returns reported by the average equity fund, it was hardly a disaster. But for the shareholders of the funds, it was a disaster. By investing after seeing those mouth-watering cumulative returns that had averaged almost 280 percent, achieved in a soaring bull market, nearly all of the buyers of these funds had missed the upside. Then. Not a moment too soon, they caught the full force of the downside. Their funds tumbled by an astonishing average of 70% during the next three years. Result, 
While a net gain of 13% was achieved by the funds themselves, the investors in these funds incurred a loss of 57%. By investing in these once high-flying funds, more than half of the capital investors had placed in these hot funds had gone up in smoke. The message is clear. Avoid performance chasing based on short-term returns, especially during great bull markets. Though the results are hardly as dramatic, the principle of don't chase past performance also holds during more sedate stock markets. In my first book, Bogle on Mutual Funds, 1993, I compared the records of the 20 top performing mutual funds during each year from 1982 through 1992 with their records in the subsequent year. As it happened, the funds that ranked number one in each year averaged a subsequent average ranking of 284 among the list of 681 funds, outpacing 58% of their peers, or barely above average. The highest achievement on the 20 fund list for that period was turned in by the number one funds averaging a rank of 100 in the subsequent years. The clear reversion to the mean suggested by that single test represented powerful evidence that winning performance by a mutual fund is unlikely to be repeated. But of course, there is no reason, except common sense, to assume that the 1982 to 1992 experience would recur. So, just for fun, I repeated the test in 2006, beginning with the top performing 20 funds in 1995 and the top 20 funds in each of the nine subsequent years. I then checked the rank of each fund in the following year, just as before. In general, the results were remarkably similar. The average subsequent rank of the top 20 funds in 1995 to 2005 was 619, outpacing 57% of their peers and barely above the average fund among the 1,440 fund total, just like the prior test. In an interesting reversal of fortune, however, the number one funds of that era turned out to have not the highest subsequent ranking, but the lowest ranking among the top 20 list. These champions subsequently earned an average ranking of 949 among the 1,440 fund total, outpacing only 34% of their peers. While the first can be first sometimes, the first can be last at other times. A wonderful illustration of the inevitable randomness of fund performance. The message is clear. Reversion to the mean, RTM. In this case, the tendency of funds whose records substantially exceed industry norms to return to average or below is alive and well in the mutual fund industry. As we have seen in stock market blow-offs, the first shall be last. But in more typical environments, reversion to the fund mean, which, as we have seen in earlier chapters, substantially lags the return earned by a stock market index fund, is the rule. So just remember that the stars produced in the mutual fund field are rarely stars. All too often they are comets, lighting up the firmament for a few moments in time and then flaming out, their ashes floating gently to earth. With each passing year, the reality is increasingly clear. Fund returns seem to be random. Yes, there are rare cases where skill seems to be involved, but it would require decades to determine how much of a fund's success can be attributed to luck and how much attributed to skill. And by then, you might ask yourself questions like these. 1. How long will that manager, with that staff, and with that strategy remain on the job? 2. If the fund's assets are many times larger at the end of the period than at the beginning, will the same results that were attractive in the first place be sustained? In short, selecting mutual funds on the basis of short-term performance is all too likely to be hazardous duty and almost always destined to produce returns that fall far short of those achieved by the stock market itself, so easily achievable through an index fund. Don't take my word for it. Listen to Nassim Nicholas Taleb, author of Fooled by Randomness. Toss a coin? Heads! and the manager will make $10,000 over the year. Tails, and he will lose $10,000.
We run the contest for the first year for 10,000 managers. At the end of the year, we expect 5,000 managers to be up $10,000 each and 5,000 to be down $10,000. Now we run the game a second year. Again, we can expect 2,500 managers to be up two years in a row. Another year, 1,250. A fourth one, 625. A fifth, 313. We have now, simply in a fair game, 313 managers who made money for five years in a row. And in 10 years, just 10 of the original 10,000 managers. Out of pure luck, a population entirely composed of bad managers will produce a small amount of great track records. The number of managers with great track records in a given market depends far more on the number of people who started in the investment business in place of going to dental school rather than on their ability to produce profits. That may sound theoretical, so let's get down to brass tacks. Hear Money Magazine's colloquy with Ted Aronson, partner of successful money management firm Aronson Johnson Ortiz. Question. You've said that investing in an actively managed fund, as opposed to a passively run index fund, is an act of faith. What do you mean? Answer. Under normal circumstances, it takes between 20 and 800 years of monitoring performance to statistically prove that a money manager is skillful, not lucky. To be 95% certain that a manager is not just lucky, it can easily take nearly a millennium, which is a lot more than most people have in mind when they say long term. Even to be only 75% sure he's skillful, you generally have to track a manager's performance for between 16 and 115 years. Investors need to know how the money management business really works. It's a stacked deck. The game is unfair. Question, where do you invest? Answer, in Vanguard Index Funds. I've owned Vanguard Index 500 for 23 years. Once you throw in taxes, it just skewers the argument for active management. Personally, I think indexing wins hands down. After tax, active management just can't win. Finally, Money Magazine columnist and author Jason Zweig sums up performance chasing in a single pungent sentence. Buying funds based purely on their past performance is one of the stupidest things an investor can do. Chapter 10 Seeking help in selecting funds? Look before you leap. As we now know from the evidence presented in the two previous chapters, selecting winning equity funds over the long term bears all the potential success of looking for a needle in the haystack, and selecting winning funds based on their performance over relatively short-term periods in the past is all too likely to lead, if not to disaster, at least to disappointment. So why not abandon these do-it-yourself approaches and rely on professional advice? Pick a financial consultant, the designation usually used by the stockbrokers of Wall Street and indeed brokers everywhere, or an investment advisor, the designation usually applied to non-brokers who usually, but not always, work on a fee-only rather than commission basis. I'll attempt to answer that question in this chapter, but before I do, I want to note that I'm focusing only on the ability of advisors to help you select equity funds that can produce superior returns for your portfolio. Professional investment advisors provide many other services, including asset allocation, information on tax considerations, advice on saving while you work, and on spending when you retire, and they are always there to consult with you about the financial markets. Advisors can encourage you to prepare for the future and are in a position to help you deal with the many extra investment decisions that have investment implications. That is, when you need to raise cash for a purchase of a home, building a fund for your children's college education, etc. Experienced advisors may also help you to avoid the potholes along the investment highway. Put more grossly, they may help you avoid making such dumb mistakes as chasing past performance or trying to time the market. At their best, these are important services that can enhance the implementation of your investment program. 
The overwhelming majority of investors rely on brokers or advisors for help in penetrating the dense fog of complexity that, for better or worse, permeates our financial system. If the generally accepted estimate that some 70% of America's 55 million families who invest in mutual funds do so through intermediaries is correct, then only about 15 million families choose the do-it-yourself road. The remaining 40 million families rely on professional helpers. That's the strategy that the Gottrocks family tried, as described in the parable at the beginning of this book, only to find that it resulted in failure. We'll never know exactly how much value is added or subtracted by these helpers. But it's hard for me to imagine that as a group they are other than, well, average. That is, their advice on equity fund selection produces returns for their clients that are probably not measurably different from those of the average fund as described in Chapter 4, some 2.5 percentage points per year behind the stock market itself as measured by the S&P 500 index. Of course, I'm willing to consider the possibility that the fund selections recommended by advisors are better than average. As I'll explain in the next chapter, if they merely select funds with the lowest all-in costs, hardly rocket science, they'll do better. If they're savvy enough to realize that high turnover funds are highly tax inefficient, they'll pick up important additional cost savings for you in transaction costs and taxes. If they put those two strategies together, and emphasize low-cost index funds, as so many advisors do, so much the better for their clients. And if professional investment consultants are wise enough, or lucky enough, to keep their clients from jumping on the latest and hottest bandwagon, for example, the new economy craze of the late 1990s reflected in the mania for funds investing in technology, telecommunications, and Internet stocks, their clients could earn returns that easily surpass the disappointing returns achieved by fund investors as a group. Remember the additional shortfall of 2.7 percentage points per year relative to the average equity fund that we estimated in Chapter 5? During 1980 to 2005, the nominal return of fund investors came to just 7.3 percent per year, despite a wonderful stock market in which a simple S&P 500 index fund earned a return of 12.3 percent. Alas, from the standpoint of the advisors, there is simply no evidence that the fund selection advice they provide has produced any better returns than those achieved by fund investors on average. In fact, the evidence goes the other way. A recent study by a research team led by two Harvard Business School professors concluded that, during 1996 to 2002 alone, the underperformance of broker channel funds, advisors sold, relative to funds sold through the direct channel, purchased directly by investors, cost investors approximately $9 billion per year. Specifically, the study found that advisor asset allocations were no better, that they chased market trends, and that those they advised paid higher upfront charges. In all, the study concludes that the weighted average return of equity funds held by investors who relied on advisors, excluding all charges paid up front or at the time of redemption, averaged just 2.9% per year. 2.9% per year, compared with the 6.6% .6 earned by investors who take charge of their own affairs. This powerful evidence, however, does not bring the researchers to the clear conclusion that advice in its totality has negative value. We remain, the report states, open to the possibility that substantial intangible benefits exist and will undertake more research to identify these intangible benefits and explore the elite group of advisors who do improve the welfare of households who trust them. There is other powerful evidence that the use of stockbrokers, as distinct from financial advisors, has a strong negative impact on the returns earned by fund investors. In a study prepared for Fidelity Investments covering the 10-year period 1994 to 2003 inclusive, broker-managed funds had the lowest ratings, relative to their peers, of any group of funds. The other groups included funds operated by privately owned managers, by publicly owned managers, by managers owned by financial conglomerates, and by bank managers. The Merrill Lynch funds, for example, 
were 18 percentage points below the fund industry average. The Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley funds were 9 percentage points below average. And the Wells Fargo and Smith Barney funds were both 8 percentage points behind. It is the job of the brokerage firm and its brokers and financial consultants to sell something every single day. When the firm introduces a new fund, it must be sold to someone. Imagine a day when nobody sold anything and the stock market lay fallow, silent all day long. A Merrill Lynch example illustrates the challenges faced by investors who rely on stockbrokers. In March of 2000, when the bubble created by the Internet stock craze was at its peak, Merrill Lynch, the world's largest stock brokerage firm, jumped on the bandwagon with two new funds to sell. Merrill created a pair of new economy funds. One was a Focus 20 fund, based on the then popular theory that if a manager's 100 favorite stocks were good, surely his 20 favorites would be even better. The other was, yes, an Internet Strategies Fund. The public offering of the two funds was an incredible success. Merrill's brokers pulled in $2 billion from their trusting, or was it performance chasing clients? $0.9 billion in Focus 20 and $1.1 billion in Internet Strategies. The subsequent returns of the funds, however, were an incredible failure. Not surprising. The smartest time to sell a new fund to investors, when it's hot, is often the dumbest time to buy it. Internet Strategies went into the tank almost immediately. Its asset value dropped 61% during the remainder of 2000 and another 62% by October 2001, a total loss of a cool 86%, as most of its investors cashed out their shares at huge losses. Then, with the fund's original $1.1 billion of assets down to just $128 million, Merrill decided to kill Internet Strategies and give it a decent burial, merging it with another Merrill fund. Keeping a record like that alive would have been a continuing embarrassment. For what it's worth, the losses in Focus 20 were less severe. Its asset value declined 28% in the remainder of 2000, another 70% in 2001, and another 39% in 2002, before finally posting positive returns in the three years that followed. On balance, its cumulative lifetime return through late 2006 came to minus 79 percent. Investors have regularly withdrawn their capital, and the fund's assets, which would reach almost $1.5 billion in 2000, currently languish at $82 million, a 95 percent decline. But unlike its Internet Strategies cousin, Focus 20 soldiers on. The lesson remains. The $2 billion marketing successes of the Merrill Lynch Internet Strategies Fund and Focus 20 Fund were utter failures for their clients, who lost some 80% of their hard-earned savings. The New York Times Contest, $50,000 invested in 1993. Capital appreciation of mutual fund portfolios of advisors in 2000, $88,500. In an S&P index fund, $138,750. A more extensive test of the ability of financial advisors to outpace the S&P 500 index was initiated by the New York Times in 1993. The editors asked five respected advisors, none were brokers, how they would invest $50,000 for a tax-free retirement account holding mutual fund shares for an investor who had a time horizon of at least 20 years. The comparative standard would be the returns earned by Vanguard 500 Index Fund. Each quarter, the Times faithfully published the records of the Index Fund and the advisors, tracking their initial portfolios and the subsequent changes they made. By 2000, seven years later, the Times reported their accomplishments. The $50,000 hypothetical portfolios run by the advisors had grown, on average, to a value of $138,500 on June 30, 2000. The highest value was $155,100. The lowest, $111,800.
While the editors properly acknowledged that not one of these advisors was able to outpace the result of the Vanguard 500 index fund, they failed to report its final value based on that initial investment of $50,000. The answer, I thoughtfully provided it to the paper in a subsequent letter to the editor, was $188,750. That is, the average advisor produced a paper profit of $88,500 on his portfolio of recommended funds, about 40% less than the profit of $138,750 on the index fund. All the news that's fit to print? In mid-2000, the Times abruptly terminated the contest without notice. I do not know why, since the original stated intention was to make a 20-year evaluation. But I can guess either that the advisors were too embarrassed to continue to participate in the contest, or that, as the differential in favor of the passively managed index fund grew, quarter after quarter, the contest became sort of non-newsworthy, even boring. I also have no idea why the New York Times determined that the remarkable differential in favor of the index fund was not news that's fit to print. Of course, we'll never know what would have happened had the contest continued, but the fact is that the Times terminated it at the moment of triumph for the index fund and at the very peak of the bull market. Since then, the index fund, like the market itself, of course, has barely held its own. While we don't know whether the advisors would have changed their portfolios, we can calculate how those funds they held in 2000 have since performed. Two advisors did considerably better than the index fund during that subsequent period. One was worse, and one about the same. The results of the fifth advisor can't be measured, for two of the funds in his portfolio no longer exist. Despite this all-too-typical reversion to the mean, the index fund continued its superiority for the full period, with a final value of $181,800, compared to $167,700 for the fund portfolio of the average advisor, surpassing on balance three of the four remaining advisors. So even if we give these advisors the benefit of the doubt in this contest of active fund advisors versus the passive index fund, the index fund wins again. I endorse the idea that for many, indeed most investors, financial advisors may provide valuable service in giving you peace of mind, in helping you establish a sensible fund portfolio that matches your appetite for reward and your tolerance for risk, and in helping you to stay the course in troubled waters. But the evidence I've presented so far strongly confirms my original hypothesis that Vital as those services may be, advisors as a group cannot be credibly relied upon to add value by selecting winning funds for you. Let me add just one final piece of compelling evidence to support that thesis. Mark Holbert, editor of the Holbert Financial Digest, has been monitoring the real-time records of financial advisors who report their recommendations in newsletters subscribed to by investors. He has tracked the performance of these advisors over the past 26 years, and here's what he finds. 1. Most of the several hundred newsletters now being published didn't even exist in 1980. 2. Of the 35 that existed in 1980, only 13 are still in business today. Only 3 outperformed the market over the subsequent 26 years. 3. Of the other 22 advisors, only two were ahead of the S&P 500 index when they discontinued publication. Four, an initial $100,000 investment in the S&P 500 index 26 years ago would be worth nearly $2,500,000 today. By way of contrast, a similar investment in the portfolios managed by the advisors tracked by Holbert would be worth about $1,400,000. Holbert's conclusion you can outperform more than 80% of your fellow investors over the next several decades simply by investing in an index fund and doing nothing else. Deja vu all over again? Perhaps Yogi Bear's famous aphorism is apt here. Consider, if you will, Holbert's finding that only three of the 35 original advisory organizations in 1980, 9%, were able to beat the stock market. 
Then consider the finding in Chapter 8, Don't Look for the Needle, Buy the Haystack, that only 24 of 355 mutual funds in business in 1970, 7%, were able to beat the stock market by one percentage point or more per year. Those similar tiny odds in favor of success are sending us the same message. Then consider the return calculated by Holbert on that original $100,000, $2.5 million in the index, compared to just $1.4 million for the portfolio of the average advisor. How similar to the results of the study I prepared for the Vanguard Board of Directors in 1975. My recommendation that we form the world's first index fund was based in part on the fact that $100,000 invested in the average equity fund in 1945 would have grown to $2.5 million in the S&P 500 index versus $1.6 million in the average equity mutual fund. Those similar margins of approximately $1 million in favor of indexing are also sending us the same message. Listen to it. These historic parallels surely reinforce the thesis that index funds endure, while most advisors and funds do not. That index fund returns strongly exceed the returns earned even by those funds and advisors that do survive. That the odds against successful fund selection by advisors are large. And that compounding these rather consistent differentials and rates of annual return mount up to truly staggering differences in wealth accumulation over the long term. If you decide to select an advisor, please consider these findings. Then make sure you are paying a fair fee, which of course results in a deduction from whatever rate of return your fund portfolio earns. Since most investment advisory fees tend to begin in the range of 1% per year, be sure to balance the worth of all the peripheral services that advisors provide against the reduction in your returns that those fees are likely to represent over time. Finally, and this will hardly surprise you, look with particular favor on advisors who recommend stock and bond index funds in their model portfolios. Don't take my word for it. Listen please once again to the widely respected investment advisor William Bernstein, who writes in the Four Pillars of Investment Wisdom as follows. You will want to ensure that your advisor is choosing your investments purely on their investment merit and not on the basis of how the vehicles reward him. The warning signs here are recommendations of load funds, insurance products, limited partnerships, or separate accounts. The best and only way to make sure that you and your advisor are on the same team is to make sure that he is fee-only, that is, that he receives no remuneration from any other source besides you. Fee only is not without pitfalls, however. Your advisor's fee should be reasonable. It is simply not worth paying anybody more than 1% to manage your money. Above $1 million, you should be paying no more than 0.75%, and above $5 million, no more than 0.5%. Your advisor should use index or passive stock funds wherever possible. If he tells you that he is able to find managers who can beat the indexes, he is fooling both you and himself. I refer to a commitment to passive indexing as asset class religion. Don't hire anyone without it. Chapter 11 Selecting the Lowest Cost Equity Funds The more the managers take, the less the investors make. What have we learned in the previous three chapters? Selecting equity funds based on long-term past performance hasn't been the answer. Selecting funds based on past short-term performance hasn't been the answer either. Even relying on the best intention financial advice seems to work only spasmodically. How can successful fund selection prove so difficult? Because of something that, deep down, we intuitively know. Performance comes and goes. But we also know something else worth knowing. We can be more successful in selecting winning funds by focusing not on the inevitable evanescence of past performance, but by focusing on something that does seem to go on forever, or, more fairly, a factor that usually persists over sustained periods of time. That factor is the costs of owning mutual funds. Costs go on forever. 
One major cost is the fund's expense ratio, and it tends to change little over time. While some funds scale down their fee rates as assets grow, the reductions are usually sufficiently modest that high-cost funds tend to remain high-cost, that low-cost funds tend to remain low-cost, and the handful of very low-cost funds tends to remain very low-cost, and that average-cost funds, too, tend to persist in that category. Another large cost of equity fund ownership is the sales charge paid on each purchase of shares. It, too, tends to persist. Load funds rarely become no-load funds, and vice versa. I can recall no large fund organization making the immediate conversion from a load to a no-load distribution system since Vanguard took that drastic and unprecedented step more than 30 years ago. Funds' portfolio turnover costs also tend to persist. Transactions cost money, and we estimate that turnover costs are roughly one-half percent on each purchase and sale, meaning that a fund with 100 percent portfolio turnover would cost shareholders about one percent of assets year after year. Similarly, 50 percent turnover would cost about 0.5 percent, and 10 percent turnover would cost about 0.1 percent, and so on. Rule of thumb. Turnover costs equal 1% of the turnover rate. Most comparisons of fund costs rely solely on reported expense ratios and uniformly find that such ratios correspond inversely with returns. Higher costs are associated with lower returns, not only for equity funds as a group, but in each of the nine Morningstar style boxes, large, mid, and small cap funds, growth, value, and blended objectives. While few comparisons take into account the additional cost of fund portfolio turnover, a similar relationship exists. Funds in the low turnover quartile consistently outperform those in the high turnover quartile for all equity funds as a group and in all nine style boxes. When we add that turnover cost to each fund's expense ratio, the relationship is sheer dynamite. Taking into account both costs, we find that the all-in costs range from 0.9% in the lowest cost quartile to 3% in the highest cost quartile. This exercise ignores sales charges and, therefore, overstates the net returns earned by load funds. Costs matter. That 2.1 percentage point difference constitutes a huge portion of the 2.7 point advantage in the returns among the lowest cost funds over the highest cost funds during the past 10 years. Net annual return of low-cost funds, 11.7%. Net annual return of high-cost funds, just 9%. A 30% enhancement in each year's return achieved simply by relying on relative costs as our guide to performance. Please also note that in each of the fund quartiles, when we add the cost to the fund's reported net returns, the gross annual returns earned in each category are virtually identical. They fall into a narrow range, a high of 12.8% for the third quartile and a low of 12% for the fourth quartile. Costs indeed account for the difference. And there is another significant difference. Step by step, as costs increase, so does risk, using as our measure the volatility of monthly returns. Those lowest expense, lowest turnover cost funds assumed fully 34% less risk than their highest cost cousins. When we take that reduction in risk into account, the risk-adjusted annual return for the low-cost quartile comes to 11.9%, fully 47% higher than the 8.1% risk-adjusted return of the high-cost quartile. When we compound those annual returns over time, the cumulative difference reaches staggering proportions. Total compound gain for the period, 207% for the low-cost funds, 118% for the high-cost funds, an enhancement arising almost entirely from the cost differential. In other words, the final value of the low-cost funds more than tripled over the decade, while the value of the high-cost funds barely doubled. Surely, fishing in the low-cost pond should enhance your returns, and by a wide margin at that. Again, yes, Costs matter. But if one is seeking the lowest cost funds, why limit the search to actively managed funds? 
The classic index fund had the lowest costs of all, an expense ratio averaging 0.2% per year during this period. With no measurable turnover costs, its total all-in costs were but 0.2%. The gross return of the 500 index fund was 11.4% per year. The net return, 11.2%. Carrying a lower risk than any of the four cost quartiles, annual price volatility averaging 15.7%, its risk-adjusted annual return was 11.4% for a cumulative risk-adjusted gain smack in the middle of the top quartile. The index fund's compound profit of 194% surpassed the 154% compound profit earned by the average fund by about one-third, all the more impressive since that average is overstated, as always, by the fact that only the funds that were good enough to survive the decade are included in the data. What's more, selecting the index fund eliminated the need for all that looking for those few needles in the haystack, represented by the very few active funds that have performed better than the market haystack itself, in the often vain hope that their winning ways will continue over decades yet to come. If investors could rely on only a single factor to select future superior performers, and to avoid future inferior performers, it would be fund costs. The record could hardly be clearer. The more the managers and brokers take, the less the investors make. So why not own an index fund with no manager and no management fee, and with virtually no trading of stocks through those helpers that we mentioned in Chapter 1? Why not indeed? The next chapter will explain this idea further. Don't take my word for it. Beginning as far back as 1995, Tyler Matheson, then executive editor of Money, conceded the point. For nearly two decades, John Bogle, the tart-tongued chairman of the Vanguard Group, has preached the virtues of index funds, those boring portfolios that aim to match the performance of a market barometer. And for much of that time, millions of fund investors, not to mention dozens of financial journalists including this one, basically ignored him. Sure, we recognize the intrinsic merits of index funds, such as low annual expenses, and because the funds keep turnover to a minimum, tiny transaction costs. Moreover, because index fund managers convert paper profits into realized gains less frequently than do the skippers of actively managed funds, shareholders pay less tax each year to Uncle Sam. To be sure, those three advantages form a trio as impressive as Domingo, Pavarotti, and Carreras. Well, Jack, we were wrong. You win. Settling for average is good enough, at least for a substantial portion of most investors' stock and bond portfolios. In fact, more often than not, aiming for benchmark-matching returns through index funds assures shareholders of a better-than-average chance of outperforming the typical managed stock or bond portfolio. It's the paradox of fund investing today. Gunning for average is your best shot at finishing above average. We've come around to agreeing with the sometimes prickly, always provocative fund exec known to admirers and detractors alike as St. Jack. Indexing should form the core of most investors' fund portfolios. So, here's to you, Jack. You have a right to call it, as you recently did in a booklet you wrote, The Triumph of Indexing. Thanks, Tyler. Chapter 12. Selecting Index Funds That Own the Entire Stock Market. The Majesty of Simplicity. If low costs are good, and I don't think a single analyst, academic, or industry expert would disagree that low costs are good, why wouldn't it be logical to focus on the lowest cost funds of all? Index funds that own the entire stock market. Today, Several index funds carry expense ratios of as low as 0.1% or even less and incur turnover costs that turn out to be zero. All-in costs of just 10 basis points per year, 80% lower even than the 90 basis points for the low-cost quartile of funds described in the previous chapter. And of course, it works. Witness the real-world superiority of the S&P 500 index fund over the average equity fund over the past 25 years and over the previous decade that you've seen in earlier chapters. The case for the success of indexing in the past 
is compelling and unarguable. And with the outlook for subdued returns on stocks during the decade ahead, let me conclude my anecdotal stroll through the relentless rules of humble arithmetic with a final statistical example that suggests what the future may hold. We can, in fact, use statistics designed to project the odds that a passively managed index fund will outpace an actively managed equity fund over various time periods. The complex exercise is called Monte Carlo simulation. Footnote. Basically, a Monte Carlo simulation takes all of the monthly returns earned by stocks over a long period, even a full century, scrambles them randomly, and then computes the annual rates of return generated by each of the thousands of hypothetical portfolios. What it does is make a few simple assumptions about the volatility of equity fund returns and the extent to which they vary from the returns earned in the stock market, as well as an assumption about the all-in costs of equity investing. The particular example I now present assumes that index fund costs will run to 0.25% per year and that the costs of active management will run to 2% per year. Note that this is a larger cost than available through the lowest cost index funds and a much smaller cost than is typified equity mutual funds. As a result, we've given actively managed funds the benefit of a very large doubt. Result. Over one year, about 29% active managers on average would be expected to outpace the index. Over five years, about 15% would be expected to win. Over 10 years, 9%. Over 25 years, 5%. And over 50 years, just 2% of active managers would be expected to win. How will the future actually play out? Of course, we can't be sure. But we know what the past 25 years looked like, and we know that over the past 35 years, only 9 of the 355 funds in business at the outset were able to outperform the stock market index by more than 2% per year. What's more, even the majority of these winners lost their early edge a decade or more ago. So it looks like our statistical odds are in the right ballpark. Thus, it seems clear that stock index funds deserve an important place in your portfolio, even as they constitute the overriding portion of my own. Whatever the case, in the era of subdued returns that most likely lies in prospect, fund costs will become more important than ever. Even more so when we move from the illusion that mutual funds as a group can capture whatever returns our financial markets provide to the even greater illusion that most mutual fund investors can capture even those depleted returns in their own fund portfolios. So what the index fund has going for it is, as I have often said, the magic of simplicity in an empire of parsimony. So let me reiterate. Don't ever forget all of those pesky costs. Fund expense ratios, sales charges, and turnover costs, tax costs, and the most subtle cost of all, the cost of living. The rising cost of living, which we describe as inflation, is virtually guaranteed to substantially erode the spending power of our investments over time. Also, don't ever forget that only in the rarest cases do fund investors succeed in capturing the returns that the funds themselves report. My conclusions about the market returns we can expect in the years ahead, as well as my conclusions about the share of those returns that funds will capture, and the share of those returns that we investors will actually enjoy, have one thing in common. They rely not on opinion, but largely on mathematical facts. The relentless rules of humble arithmetic. The very same rules that make selecting winning funds rather like looking for a needle in a haystack. Only at your peril should you ignore these rules. If, as I said at the outset, the road to investment success is hazardous, filled with dangerous turns and giant potholes, never forget that simple arithmetic can enable you to moderate those turns and avoid those potholes. So do your best to diversify to the nth degree, minimize your investment expenses, and focus your own emotions where they cannot wreak the kind of havoc that they create in most investment programs. Rely on your own common sense. Emphasize all stock market index funds. Carefully consider your risk tolerance. 
and the portion of your investments you allocate to equities. Then, stay the course. I should add, importantly, that all index funds are not created equal. While their index-based portfolios are, of course, substantially identical, their costs are anything but identical. Some have minuscule expense ratios. Others have expense ratios that surpass the bounds of reason. Some are no-load funds. Nearly a third, as it turns out, have substantial front-end loads, often with an option to pay those loads over a period of usually five years. Others entail the payment of standard brokerage commission. Today, there are some 115 index mutual funds designed to track the S&P 500 index. Astonishingly, more than half of them carry an initial sales load, albeit often concealed by offering Class B shares with no front-end load but an extra heavy annual fee used to pay the broker. The wise investor will be sure to select only those index funds that are available without sales loads and those operating with the very lowest costs. These costs, no surprise here, are directly related to the net returns delivered to the shareholders of these funds. In the past, some 500 index-based funds may have earned small increases in return or been penalized by small reductions based on their manager's ability or inability to employ strategies that allow small short-term departures from the exact weightings of the stocks in the index. I assume, however, that these variations will be lower in the future and have therefore ignored them as an element in the cost-value equation. Funds tracking a particular index are, or should be, commodities in terms of their portfolios and the returns they provide. So variations in costs make the difference. While cost differentials may look trivial when expressed on an annual basis, compounded over the years, they make the difference between investment success and failure. Profit earned in Index 500 Fund A, $99,100. In Index Fund B, $122,700. All index funds are not created equal. Let's go back to January 1984, for example, when the second index fund was formed, Wells Fargo Equity Index Fund, and compare its subsequent return with that of the original Vanguard Index Fund over the same period. Both funds selected the S&P 500 Index as their benchmark. The Vanguard Index 500 carried no initial sales commission and operated with an expense ratio averaging 0.28% annually. By 2005, the ratio had decreased to 0.18% and to 0.09% for longer-term investors and those who had $100,000 or more invested in the fund. The Wells Fargo Fund, on the other hand, carried an initial sales charge of 5 and 3 quarters percent and its expense ratio averaged 0.8% per year, 0.64% in 2005. These seemingly small differences added up to a 23% enhancement in value for the Vanguard Fund. An original investment of $10,000 in each produced a profit of $122,700 for the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, compared to $99,100 for the Wells Fargo Equity Index Fund. All index funds are not created equal. Intelligent investors will select the lowest cost index funds that are available from reputable fund organizations. Your fund should be your cash cow, not the manager's. Some years ago, a Wells Fargo representative was asked how the firm could justify such high charges. The answer? You don't understand. It's our cash cow. That is, it generates lots of profits to the manager. By carefully selecting the lowest cost index funds for your portfolio, you can be sure that the fund is not the manager's cash cow, but your own. Given my preference for the all-market index fund, I almost hesitate to tell you that, since that lonely first S&P index was formed in 1975, a staggering total of another 578 more index funds are now in operation. So investors now face a mind-boggling set of confusing choices, large cap, mid cap, small cap, industry sectors, international, single country, and so on. To make it even more confusing, 
Indexing works like a charm in every one of these areas. An index fund is inevitably destined to surpass the returns earned by the other investors in the market segment tracked by its index. Even though we never have complete information about the precise returns earned by investors as a group in each segment, given the relentless rules of humble arithmetic, it must work that way. Standard & Poor's Corporation now compares index returns with actual returns achieved by active managers in a whole variety of U.S. market segments and the results are unmistakable. Over the past five years alone, the S&P 500 index has outpaced 67 percent of large-cap general equity funds, while the S&P mid-cap 400 index has outperformed 84 percent of mid-cap funds, and the S&P small-cap 600 index has outperformed 79 percent of all small-cap funds. Remarkable, but unsurprising. While these comparisons, sorted by number of funds rather than by fund assets, have the flaws noted earlier, the message could hardly be clearer. Indexing is the winning strategy. It's worth noting that Standard & Poor's attempts to take survivor bias into account in its calculations. Interestingly, during the past five years alone, an astonishing 28% of all general equity funds have gone out of business. That's one more warning about relying on actively managed mutual funds as long-term investments. While it is alleged that indexing doesn't work in less efficient markets, that is, outside of the S&P 500, the impressive performance of the small and mid-cap index suggests that it works perfectly well, as it must. For whether markets are efficient or inefficient, as a group, all investors in that segment earn the return of that segment. Yes, in markets that are inefficient, the most successful managers may achieve unusually large returns. But never forget that as a group, all investors in any discrete segment of the stock market must be, and are, average. For each big success, there must also be a big failure. But after all those deductions of even larger management fees, and the damaging impact of the even larger turnover costs that funds incur in less efficient markets, the aggregate lag widens. So even in individual market segments, index funds with their tiny costs win again. International funds are also subject to the same allegations that it is easier for managers to win in supposedly less efficient markets, but also to no avail. S&P reports that the International Index, World Markets Less U.S. Stocks, outpaced 80% of actively managed international equity funds over the past five years. Similarly, the S&P Emerging Markets Index outpaced 88% of emerging market funds. I'm not sure what additional data are required to make the case for indexing. But while investing in particular market sectors is done most efficiently through index funds, betting on the winning sectors is exactly that, betting. And emotions, once again, are almost certain to have a powerful negative impact on the returns the investors achieve. Whatever returns each sector itself may earn, the investors in those very sectors will likely, if not certainly, fall well behind them. For there is abundant evidence that the most popular sector funds of the day are those that have recently enjoyed the most spectacular recent performance, and that such after-the-fact popularity is a recipe for unsuccessful investing. For example, when Vanguard created the industry's first growth index and value index funds in 1992, the former was designed for younger investors focused on wealth accumulation, seeking tax efficiency, and willing to assume larger risks. The latter was designed for older investors, focused on wealth preservation, seeking higher income, and happy to reduce their risks. Alas, while the original idea was strong, the ensuing reality was weak. What followed their introduction was as crystal clear an example of classic performance chasing as one could imagine. During the 1993 to 1997 period, the stock market was relatively placid, and value stocks and growth stocks delivered similar returns. Then, in the new economy bubble, growth stocks took off, earning a cumulative return by 2000 that left value stocks in the dust. 
1992 to March 2000, growth index total return, 364%. Value index total return, 229%. Après moi, la deluge. Reversion to the mean took hold, and growth stocks plummeted through 2002. Investor interest in the two fund styles was well balanced during the early years. But in the bubble that followed, investors poured $11 billion into the soaring growth index fund, nearly four times the $3 billion invested in the sedate value index fund. Then, in the aftermath, investors switched their loyalty, with net redemptions of $850 million in the growth fund during 2001 to 2006, and net purchases approaching $2 billion in the value fund. Since 1993, the two funds have achieved substantial positive returns on a standard time-weighted basis, 9.1% per year for growth and 11.2% for value. With their counterproductive timing and selection, however, investors in these index funds have not come even close to matching those returns. The average dollar-weighted return of investors in the growth index fund was a pathetic 0.9% per year. While investors in the value index fund did better, their return of 7.6% still lagged the return of the value index itself by 3.6 percentage points per year. Since 1993, the cumulative return of the growth index has been 224% versus 320% for the value index based on the traditional calculation of fund performance. The growth index fund investor, meanwhile, earned but 13%, and the value index fund investor earned about 170%. Despite my best intentions when they were formed, Vanguard's growth and value index funds proved to be a paradigm for the ways that investors fool themselves, relinquishing perfectly acceptable long-term returns in their search to find the holy grail of extra returns in the short run. So look before you leap in trying to pick which market sector to bet on. It's not as exciting, but owning the classic stock market index fund is the ultimate strategy. It holds the mathematical certainty that marks it as the gold standard in investing, and the alchemists of active management cannot turn their own lead or copper or iron into gold. Just avoid complexity rely on simplicity, take costs out of the equation, and trust the arithmetic. Don't take my word for it. If you think that my calculation of the odds that only 2% of all equity mutual portfolios will outperform the stock market over 50 years are too pessimistic, consider the odds calculated by Michael J. Mabusin, Chief Market Strategist at Leg Mason, Adjunct Professor at Columbia Business School, and author of the best-selling More Than You Know. While my 2% estimate would mean that one portfolio in 50 would outperform the stock market, Mabusin calculates the odds at 1 in 223,000. Either way, the odds of outpacing an all-market index fund are, well, terrible. Now listen to Warren Buffett's widely esteemed partner, Charlie Munger who eloquently states the case for shunning the foolish complexity of investing and opting for simplicity. At large charitable foundations in recent years, there has been a drift toward more complexity. Some foundations have tried to become much better versions of Bernie Kornfeld's Fund of Funds. In some funds, there are not few but many investment counselors, chosen by an additional layer of consultants who are hired to decide which investment counselors are best help in allocating funds to various categories, ensure that claimed investment styles are scrupulously followed, plus a third layer of the security analysts employed by investment banks. There is one thing sure about all this complexity. The total cost of all the investment management, plus the frictional costs of fairly often getting in and out of many large investment positions, can easily reach 3% of foundation net worth per annum. All the equity investors in total will surely bear a performance disadvantage per annum equal to the total croupier's costs that they have jointly elected to bear. And it is unescapable that exactly half of the investors will get a result below the median result after the croupier's take, a median result that may well be somewhere between unexciting and lousy. 
The wiser choice is to dispense with the consultants and reduce the investment turnover by changing to indexed investment in equities. Chapter 13 Bond Funds and Money Market Funds The Relentless Rules Repeat Even More Powerfully So far, all of our discussion about the index fund and its handmaiden, low investment costs, has related to the stock market and to equity mutual funds. But the relentless rules of humble arithmetic with which I've regaled you also apply, arguably even more forcefully, to bond funds and money market funds. Perhaps it's obvious why this is so. While a seemingly infinite number of factors influence the stock market and each individual stock that is traded there, a single factor influences the bond market and the money market, and for that matter, each individual fixed income security, far more than any other, the prevailing level of interest rates. Managers of fixed income funds can't do much, if anything, to influence rates. If they don't like the rates established in that market, calling the Treasury Department or the Federal Reserve, or otherwise trying to change the supply and demand equation, is unlikely to bear fruit. So let's be clear. In the long run, virtually 100% of the return on any bond fund or money market fund is accounted for by the net interest income it generates for its shareholders. The only way for a manager to add an increment to that return is to make interest rate bets. For example, selling bonds when the market expects rates to go up and prices down, and then buying bonds when the reverse is expected to happen. If you think that picking stocks and timing their purchase is hard, just imagine how hard it is to execute these same strategies successfully in the incredibly efficient precincts of the bond market. Thus, managers of fixed income funds will almost inevitably deliver an investment return that parallels the baseline constituted by the interest rate environment. Yes, a few managers might do better, even do better for a long time, by being extra smart or extra lucky, or by taking extra risk. Yet even the best bond and money market managers can add only a few fractions of 1% per year to your long-term returns, albeit only by risking a comparable shortfall. What's more, even if these margins are achieved, they rarely overcome the fees, sales loads, and expenses involved in acquiring their services. While these costs make the task of adding returns far more difficult, Overly confident bond fund managers may be tempted to take just a little extra risk by extending maturities of the bonds in the portfolio. Long-dated bonds, say, 30 years, are much more volatile than short-term bonds, say, 2 years, but usually provide higher yields. They are also tempted to reduce the investment quality of the portfolio, holding less in U.S. Treasury bonds, rated AAA, or in investment-grade corporate bonds, rated triple B or better, and holding more in below-investment-grade bonds, double B or lower, or even some junk bonds, rated below double C, or even unrated. Since stocks represent the residual ownership, or equity of corporations, we don't usually associate the word safety with them. Unlike bonds, stocks can't default. Bonds, on the other hand, represent debt, if the payments of interest that corporations and governments promise to make every six months are threatened, their ratings will be downgraded and their market values reduced. And if they finally fail to make the promised payments, they enter bankruptcy proceedings. Where bonds are concerned, Brandeis's warning becomes particularly meaningful. Remember, O oh stranger, arithmetic is the first of the sciences and the mother of safety. There are too many types of bond funds to try your patience by examining all of them. So let's examine the three basic maturity levels that have become the industry standard, one in each of the three major bond segments, taxable, corporate and government bonds, tax-exempt municipal bonds, and U.S. Treasury bonds. We'll begin with intermediate-term taxable bond funds, then turn to long-term tax-exempt bond funds and then evaluate funds investing in short-term U.S. Treasury notes. As you'll see, the low-cost intermediate-term bond index fund is a truly superior performer. This finding should no longer surprise you. Footnote. 
I apologize, sort of, for using Vanguard funds for the examples of the market indexes. But there are a few other bond funds in these categories using index or index-like strategies, and literally none with lower costs. With a 10-year return averaging 6.8% annually, it comes within a whisper of outpacing the cost-adjusted return of the comparable Lehman 5-10 to year government corporate bond index. What is more, the index fund's annual return of 6.8% was almost 25% higher than the 5.5% return of its average peer. While the actively managed bond funds as a group earned a lower gross return than either the index fund or the index, relative cost proved to be the principal differentiator in net return. As a group, the portfolios of the actively managed bond funds include about 25% corporate and 75% U.S. government bonds, largely bonds of government agencies, while the bond index and the bond index fund include about 50% in corporates and 50% in governments, while the bond index fund carried slightly more volatility risk with an annualized standard deviation of 5% versus 3.7 percent for the active managers, both figures represent an extremely low risk level. And so the message echoes. In intermediate term taxable bond funds, in terms of maximizing your return and minimizing your risk, the low cost index fund is truly a superior performer. The Vanguard Intermediate Term Bond Index Fund, for example, has an expense ratio of 0.18 percent, less than one-fifth of the 1% expense ratio of its average peer. In addition, its return benefits from the absence of sales loads. Always avoid bond funds with sales loads. A typical 5% load, for example, would obliterate your entire yield for the first year. With a cumulative final value of an initial investment of $10,000 growing to $19,289 in the index fund, versus just $17,081 for its average rival. The index strategy is a winning strategy, outpacing an amazing 550 of its 570 peers over the past decade. In long-term tax-exempt bond funds, once again, indexing wins. Now let's consider long-term maturities and turn our attention to tax-exempt municipal bond funds. Because of complexities in the construction of municipal bond indexes, there are no pure index funds in this category. But the results of the major index in the field, the Lehman Brothers Tax-Exempt 10-Year Maturity Index, confirm the power of indexing in surpassing the returns provided by the average active bond manager. Since the index itself provided a gross return of 5.93%, a comparable index fund, after assumed costs of 0.2%, would have provided a 5.73% net annual return. By way of comparison, the Vanguard Long-Term Tax-Exempt Bond Fund, whose expense ratio of 0.15% is actually slightly below these assumed costs for the index fund, provided a net return of 5.85%, a bit higher even than the assumed return of the bond index fund. Like the index fund, this bond fund is broadly diversified, holds a high-quality portfolio, 87% rated A or better, even higher than its actively managed peers, and minimizes turnover. Once again, low costs lead to higher returns. The 5.73% annual return of the hypothetical municipal bond index fund was roughly 15% more than the 5% earned by the average long-term municipal fund. Even though the actively managed funds were assuming higher risks, 15% in lower rated bonds versus 4% for the index and 13% for the Vanguard fund. Over the past decade, $10,000 initially invested in the Vanguard long-term municipal bond fund grew to $17,657 versus $16,306 for its average rival. Again, with low costs, broad diversification, and no serious attempt to outguess the market in long-term tax-exempt bond funds, once again, indexing wins. Its close proxy, the Vanguard Long-Term Municipal Bond Fund, ranks first among its 194 peers. In short-term treasury funds, the lowest-cost option wins again.
Our sweep of the bond fund arena concludes with an examination of short-term funds investing in U.S. Treasury obligations. There are a few surprises here. The net return earned by the index itself, 5.06% per year, adjusted for an assumed expense ratio of 0.2%, outpaces the average fund. Again, while the Vanguard short-term government bond fund is not, technically speaking, an index fund as such, it tracks the index return with remarkable precision, turning in a net average annual return of 5.06% over the past decade. The lowest cost options win again, outpacing 97 of the 122 short-term government funds. Treasuries being treasuries, investment quality is virtually uniform. Both the Vanguard Index Fund and the index itself hold 100% of their portfolios in short-term U.S. Treasury notes, and the active funds hold 99%. With its towering 0.92% average expense ratio, the average bond fund has a lot to overcome. It doesn't succeed, it really can't succeed, in overcoming that handicap. What's more, the index and the Vanguard fund displayed slightly less volatility than their active peers. Again, many of these funds carry sales charges, averaging 3%, which are incorporated into the average return. The tracking of its benchmark, its quality parity, and its extremely low expenses clearly mark the Vanguard Short-Term Treasury Bond Fund as the functional equivalent of the Lehman 1-5 to year government bond index. While there are no bond funds that track this index, the Vanguard Fund is the virtual equivalent of an index fund. Both provide a cumulative gains on an initial investment of $10,000 of $16,382, compared to $15,588 for the average short-term treasury fund. In money market funds, surprise, low cost wins yet again. Money market funds can be thought of as very short-term bond funds with uniformly high credit quality. Federal regulations limit money market funds to high-grade commercial and bank paper and, as a practical matter, limit maturities to the very short term, about 60 days, in order to maintain a stable asset value of $1 per share. Unlike bank savings accounts, money market funds are not guaranteed by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. As a result, money market funds hold portfolios with generally similar quality though there is often a bit of stretching for yield going on, and very short maturity, usually averaging about 40 days. As a result, they tend to earn substantially identical gross yields on their portfolios. With their short maturities, extremely high credit quality, and broadly diversified portfolios, money market funds too essentially become commodities. That is, when all else is equal, as it is here, what determines relative performance is relative cost. So just as in stock index funds and in bond index funds, cost tells virtually the entire story in money market funds. Indeed, if we rank the records of the 190 money market funds in terms of the returns they have delivered to investors over the past 10 years, highest first, and then compare their expense ratio, lowest first, the relationship is almost perfect. Vanguard Prime Money Market Fund, close cousin to our hypothetical index fund, carries the day, producing a net annual return of 3.77% for the past decade, some 15% above the return on the average money market fund. Cumulatively, a $10,000 initial investment in the Vanguard Prime Money Market Fund grew to $14,478 over the past decade versus $13,785 for its average peer. Among 190 comparable funds, it ranked number 7. Remarkably, money market funds in the high-cost quartile earned a gross return of 4.1%, about equal to the average, of course. But with a shocking annual expense ratio of 1.39%, these high-cost funds delivered a net return of just 2.71% to their owners. Why would investors ever pay more than a 0.5% annual cost for a money market fund? The answer is beyond me. They should probably have their heads examined.
how the supposedly independent directors of these 45 money funds with expense ratios at or above the 1% level could vote to approve such fees is an even bigger question. Their job is to represent the interest of the fund shareholders, and they have failed. But intelligent investors don't need to fail. If you avoid these high-cost money market funds in favor of low-cost funds, success will inevitably follow. I realize full well that investors are far more focused on equity funds and the stock market than on fixed income funds. Nonetheless, smart investors will save themselves lots of money and substantially improve their returns if they apply the principles of broad diversification, low cost, no load, minimal turnover, and long-term investing, the very characteristics that enable index funds to guarantee you your fair share of the returns in the bond and money markets, even as they do in all financial markets. Don't take my word for it. While not a lot has been written about the remarkable and remarkably obvious value of index funds that invest in bonds, the convictions that I express in this chapter have been strongly reinforced by Walter R. Good, CFA, and Roy W. Hermanson, CFA, in Index Your Way to Investment Success. Comparison of expenses, transaction costs, and, where applicable, sales loads identify the cost advantage for bond index funds. For the purposes of projecting returns, let's assume that the actively managed fund and the benchmark index fund each hold bonds that, overall, yield the same 7% annual rate of return. For the actively managed load funds, the index fund advantage amounts to 1.2 percentage points per year. The data provide a sobering glimpse of the challenge encountered by the active bond fund manager and suggest how much additional return active management may have to add, on average, over an extended period, just to break even. Near-index bond mutual funds provide an alternative to indexing the bond market. While the funds do not completely conform to the index fund model, they share key characteristics. Very high degree of diversification in the specified market segment, very low expense ratio, very low transaction costs, and absence of sales loads. Once again, further confirmation comes from across the pond. England's Timothy Hale, author of Smarter Indexing, Simpler Decisions for Better Results, writes, you should not overlook the efficacy of index investing for bonds, which up to now has been whispered rather than shouted from the rooftops. The evidence is compelling and comes down firmly in favor of investing in index funds. Over the 10-year period, 1988 to 1998, U.S. bond index funds returned 8.9% a year against 8.2% for actively managed bond funds with index funds beating 85% of all active funds. This differential is largely due to fees. Chapter 14 Creating Indexes That Beat the Market The New Paradigm Since the inception of the first index mutual fund in 1975, indexing, investing in passively managed, broadly diversified, low-cost stock and bond index funds has proved to be both a remarkable artistic success and a remarkable commercial success. In previous chapters, we've described the artistic success of index funds in providing returns to investors that have vastly surpassed the returns achieved by investors in actively managed mutual funds. Given that record, the commercial success of indexing is hardly surprising. Today, most indexed assets are concentrated in classic index funds, representing the broad U.S. stock market, the S&P 500, or the Dow Jones Wilshire 5000, the broad international stock market, the Morgan Stanley EAFE, Europe, Australia, and Far East Index, the broad international stock market, and the broad U.S. bond market. But a whole variety of market sector index funds has also sprung up, based on indexes of growth stocks, value stocks, mid- and small-cap stocks, and a variety of other discrete market segments. Any market segment that can be accurately defined and measured and made available to investors as a group can be easily indexed. Assets of the traditional classic stock index funds 
have grown from $16 million in 1976 to $445 million in 1986 to $68 billion in 1996 to $369 billion in 2006. 7% of the assets of all equity mutual funds. Assets of bond index funds have also soared from $132 million in 1986 to $6 billion in 1996 to $62 billion in 2006. 7% of the assets of all corporate and treasury bond funds. Indexing has become a competitive field. Managers of the classic index funds are engaged in a fiercely competitive price war, cutting their expense ratios to draw the assets of investors who are smart enough to realize the price is the difference. This trend is great for index fund investors, but it slashes profits to index fund managers and discourages entrepreneurs who start new fund ventures in the hopes of enriching themselves by building fund empires. So how can promoters take advantage of the proven attributes that underlie the success of the index fund? A tracking portfolio that affords broad diversification, is passively managed, and offers lower costs than actively managed mutual funds. Why create new indexes? and then claim that they will consistently outpace the broad market indexes that up until now have pretty much defined how we think of indexing. Traditional indexes, as noted in Chapter 3, are cap-weighted. That is, the weight of each stock or bond in the index portfolio is determined by its market capitalization. For the total U.S. stock market, that value is $15 trillion dollars representing the collective investment of all stockholders of U.S. equities. Remember the Gottrocks family, whom you met in Chapter 1? So it follows that, together, all investors as a group earn precisely the market's return. As you now surely realize, if the market rises by 10%, all investors as a group earn 10%, before costs, of course. So the miracle, as it were, of the index fund is simple arithmetic. By minimizing all of those costs of investing, it guarantees that its participants will earn higher net returns than all of the other participants in stock ownership as a group. This is the only approach to equity investing that can guarantee such an outcome. The only way to beat the market portfolio, obviously, is to depart from the market portfolio. And this is what active managers strive to do, individually. But collectively, of course, they can't succeed, for their trading merely shifts ownership from one holder to another. All of that swapping of stock certificates back and forth, however it may work out for a given buyer or seller, enriches only our financial intermediaries. But the money manager, in effect, puts forth this argument. I'm smarter than the others in the market. I can discover undervalued stocks, and when the market discovers them and they rise in price, I'll sell them. Then I'll discover other undervalued stocks and repeat the process all over again. I know that the stock market is highly efficient, but through my intelligence, my expert analysts, my computer programs, and my trading strategies, I can spot temporary inefficiencies and capture them over and over again. As we have seen in Chapter 8, some fund managers have actually succeeded in this task, but they are precious few in number. Over the past 36 years, just three funds out of 355, eight-tenths of one percent, have consistently distinguished themselves. Nonetheless, hope springs eternal among money managers, and they strive for excellence. Of course, they believe in themselves. This field has few shrinking violets. But they also have a vested financial interest in persuading investors that if they have done well in the past, they will continue to do so. And if they haven't done well in the past, well, better days are always ahead. But in recent years, something new has been added to the mix. Financial entrepreneurs who believe, I'm sure sincerely, if with a heavy dollop of self-interest, that they can create indexes that will beat the market. Interesting. They have developed new methods of weighting portfolio holdings that they vow will outperform the traditional market cap-weighted portfolio that represents the holdings of investors as a group. This new breed of indexers, 
not in fact indexers but active strategists, focuses on weighting portfolios by so-called fundamental factors. Rather than weighting by market cap, they use a combination of factors such as corporate revenues, cash flows, profits, or dividends. For example, the portfolio is weighted by the dollar amount of dividends distributed by each corporation rather than the dollar amount of its market capitalization. They argue, fairly enough, that in a cap-weighted portfolio, half of the stocks are overvalued to a greater or lesser extent and half are undervalued. The traditional indexer responds, of course, but who really knows which half is which? The new fundamental indexers unabashedly answer, we do. They claim to know which is which. And, this will not surprise you, the fundamental factors they have identified as the basis for their portfolio selections actually have outpaced the traditional indexes in the past. We call this data mining for you can be sure that no one would have the temerity to promote a new strategy that has lagged the traditional index fund in the past. The members of this new breed are not shy about their prescience. They claim variously, if a tad grandiosely, that they represent a new wave in indexing, a revolution that will offer investors better returns and lower volatility, and a new paradigm. Indeed, they describe themselves as the new Copernicans, after the man who concluded that the center of the solar system was not the Earth, but the Sun. They compare the traditional market cap-weighted indexers with ancient astronomers who attempted to perpetuate the Ptolemaic view of the Earth-centered universe. And they assure the world that we're at the brink of a huge paradigm shift in indexing. Of course, they come armed with vast statistical studies that prove how well their methodologies have worked in the past, or at least since 1962, when their back-tested studies began. But think for a moment about the message of Chapter 8. In mutual fund investing, the past is not prologue. These new paradigmists casually ignore that truism. For example, dividend indexes outperform capitalized weighted indexes, not have outperformed in the past. The fundamental index adds more than twice as much incremental return, not has added in the past. Investors, and managers too, love to believe that the past is prologue. It would make life so easy. But it is no accident that these new index funds are being introduced only after their strategies have seen their best days. Since the stock market bubble burst in 2000, for example, value stocks outpace growth stocks the market cap index holds both, over the subsequent five years. And for dividend-paying stocks, the pattern is about the same. Even including this recent advantage, the long-term margins of superiority achieved by these theoretically constructed back-tested portfolios are not large, between 1% and 2% per year. How much of that edge would have been confiscated by their expense ratios? The lowest is 0.28%. The average is about 0.5%. The highest that I've seen is 1.89%. How much would have been confiscated by their extra portfolio turnover costs compared to the classic index funds? How much would have been confiscated by extra taxes paid by shareholders when that turnover results in gains? Even if the modest margins claimed in the past were to repeat, which I believe is highly unlikely, these back-tested hypothetical returns would be significantly eroded, if not totally erased, by those costs. But the central issue is how can one claim that the past will be prologue and do so without a scintilla of apparent doubt? The new paradigmists have never explained why these fundamental factors have been systematically underpriced by the market in the past, and if they are underpriced, why investors, hungry to capitalize on that apparent past inefficiency, won't bid up prices until the undervaluation no longer remains. Put another way, if these promoters of the purported new paradigms actually have been right in the past, won't they therefore be wrong in the future? When managers of active equity funds claim to have a way of uncovering extra value in our highly but not perfectly efficient U.S. stock market, investors will look at their past record, consider the manager's strategies, and invest or not. 
These new index managers are in fact active managers. But they not only claim prescience, but a prescience that gives them confidence that most sectors of the market, such as dividend-paying stocks, will remain undervalued for as far ahead as the eye can see. I recommend skepticism, for I have always been impressed by the inexorable tendency for reversion to the mean in security returns. For example, mutual funds with a value mandate have generally outperformed those with a growth mandate since the late 1960s. But since 1977, indeed since 1937, there is little to choose between the two. In fact, from 1937 through 1967, growth mutual funds rather consistently trumped value mutual funds. Never think you know more than the market. Nobody does. We never know when that reversion to the mean will come to the various sectors of the stock market. But we do know that such changes in style have invariably occurred in the past. With so much of the stock market's volatility based on expectations, emotions, rather than business, economics, what else could be expected? Before we too easily accept that fundamental indexing, relying on style tilts toward dividends, value or smallness, is the new paradigm, we need a longer sense of history, as well as an appreciation that capitalization-weighted indexing does not depend on efficient markets for its utility. We have witnessed many new paradigms over the years. None has persisted. The concept stocks of the go-go years in the 1960s came and went. So did the Nifty 50 era that soon followed. The January effect of small cap superiority came and went. Option income funds and government plus funds came and went. In the late 1990s, high-tech stocks and new economy funds came as well. Today, the asset values of the survivors remain far below their peaks. Intelligent investors should approach with extreme caution a claim that any new paradigm is here to stay. That's not the way financial markets work. We do know that traditional all-market cap-weighted index funds guarantee that you will receive your fair share of stock market returns and virtually assure that you will outperform, over the long term, 90% or more of the other investors in the marketplace. Maybe this new paradigm of fundamental indexing, unlike all the other new paradigms I've seen, will work. But maybe it won't, too. I urge investors not to be tempted by the siren song of paradigms that promise the accumulation of wealth that will be far beyond the rewards of the classic index fund. Don't forget the prophetic warning of Karl von Clausewitz, military theorist and Prussian general of the early 19th century. The greatest enemy of a good plan is the dream of a perfect plan. Put your dreaming away and stick to the good plan represented by the classic index fund. Don't take my word for it. I feel strongly on this point, and I'm not alone. First hear these words from Gregory Mankiw, Harvard professor and former chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors. I am placing my bets with Bogle on this one. Then listen to William Sharp, professor of finance at Stanford and Nobel laureate in economics. It is quite remarkable that people think that somehow a scheme that weights stocks differently than capitalization can dominate a capitalization-weighted index. New paradigms come and go. Betting against the market and spending a considerable amount of money to do so is indeed likely to be a hazardous undertaking. Consider, too, this caution from John R. Minahan, Director of Research at New England Pension Consultants. I am amazed by all the managers that make an assertion of the type. In the long run, X always wins, where X could be dividend yield, earnings growth, quality of management, a quantitative factor or mix of factors, etc., yet are unable to cite a reason why X should systematically be underpriced by the market. The managers may be able to point to data suggesting that X has been associated with excess returns in the past, but without a plausible explanation of why X should outperform. Such data do not convince me that X is likely to outperform in the future. Finally, consider this affirmation of classic indexing from Wharton School Professor Jeremy I. Siegel. 
author of Stocks for the Long Term, and advisor to Wisdom Tree Investments, the promoter of the dividend-driven fundamental model. It can be shown that maximum diversification is achieved by holding each stock in proportion to its value to the entire market. Hindsight plays tricks on our minds, often distorts the past, and encourages us to play hunches and outguess other investors, who in turn are playing the same game. For most of us, trying to beat the market leads to disastrous results. Our actions lead to much lower returns than can be achieved just by staying in the market. Matching the market year after year with index funds, such as the Vanguard 500 portfolio and Vanguard's Total Stock Market Index Fund. This quotation is from the first edition of Dr. Siegel's 1994 book. I understand that he has every right to change his mind. Chapter 15 The Exchange Traded Fund A Trader to the Cause even before the rise of the so-called new paradigm of fundamental indexing described in the previous chapter, traditional indexing was being challenged by a sort of wolf in sheep's clothing, the exchange-traded fund. Simply put, the ETF is a fund designed to facilitate trading in its shares, dressed in the guise of the traditional index fund. If long-term investing was the original paradigm for the classic index fund designed 31 years ago, Surely using index funds as trading vehicles can only be described as short-term speculation. If the broadest possible diversification was the original paradigm, surely holding discrete, even widely diversified sectors of the market offers less diversification and commensurately more risk. If the original paradigm was minimal cost, it's clear that holding market sector index funds that are themselves low cost obviates neither the brokerage commissions entailed in trading them nor the tax burdens incurred if one has the good fortune to do so successfully. As to the final, quintessential aspect of the original paradigm, assuring, indeed guaranteeing, that you will earn your fair share of the stock market's return, the fact is that an investor who trades ETFs has nothing even resembling such a guarantee. In fact, after all the selection challenges, the timing risks, the extra costs, and the added taxes, the typical ETF investor has absolutely no idea of what relationship his or her investment return will have to the return earned by the stock market itself. Let me illustrate the differences between the classic index fund and the index fund nouveau represented by the ETF. The ETFs march to a different tune than the original, and I'm left to wonder, in the words of the old song, what have they done to my song, Ma? The first exchange-traded fund, created in 1992 by Nathan Most, was named Standard & Poor's Depository Receipts, SPDRs, and quickly dubbed SPIDER. It was a brilliant idea. Investing in the S&P 500 index, operated at low cost with high tax efficiency, and held for the long term, it held the prospect of providing ferocious competition to the traditional S&P 500 index fund although brokerage commissions obviated its use, for example, by investors making small, regular investments. Most of the investors in the spiders, however, were not long-term investors. They were active money managers, hedgers, and professional traders. Some 65 million shares of spiders, $8.8 .8 billion worth, are now traded every day, with an annualized turnover of some 3,600% per year. From that single fund, ETFs have grown to be a huge part, $340 billion, of the $900 billion index fund asset base, a 38% share, up from just 9% as 2000 began and only 3% a decade ago. Led by index portfolios whose shares are rapidly traded in narrow market segments, and despite their stark contradiction of each of the five concepts underlying the original index fund, ETFs have become a force to be reckoned with in the financial markets. Their amazing growth certainly says something about the energy of Wall Street's financial entrepreneurs, the focus of money managers on gathering assets, the marketing power of brokerage firms, and the willingness, nay, eagerness, of investors to favor complexity over simplicity, continuing to believe, against all odds, that they can beat the market. When we look beyond the dollar aggregates, 
it becomes clear how far ETFs have departed from the norm. The diversity of the investment choices available is remarkable. Among the 285 ETFs available today are 12 total stock market index funds, such as the Spider, the largest segment in terms of assets, 66 focused on investment styles, 133 based on stock market sectors, and 56 concentrating their assets in particular foreign countries. Footnote. Amazingly, there are an additional 150 ETFs in registration at the Securities Exchange Commission. Could this be a fad? There are also a handful of bond ETFs and a scattering of ETFs utilizing high leverage, doubling the swings in the stock market, tracking commodity prices and currencies, and other high-risk strategies. In recent years, the flood of assets into ETFs has approached a stampede. Since 1999, ETFs have drawn $280 billion of net new money, even larger than the $190 billion flowing into their classic cousins. What's more, the flow into style, sector, and foreign funds has overwhelmed the flow into the broad stock market index component. While in the early ETF years, these broad funds accounted for 100% of the total ETF inflow, during 2000 to 2006, they accounted for less than 20%. So far this year, their $2 billion of cash outflow presents a startling contrast to the inflow of $40 billion of cash that's been poured into the less diversified groups. All stock market ETFs are, in my view, the only instance in which an ETF can replicate, and possibly even approve upon, the five paradigms of the original index fund, but only when they are bought and held for the long term. Their annual expense ratios are usually, but not always, slightly lower than their mutual fund counterparts, although commissions on purchases erode any advantage and may even overwhelm it. While their tax efficiency should be higher, Actual practice so far has failed to confirm theory, and those investors who trade them are subject to their own taxes. The fact is that their use by long-term investors is minimal. The spiders are, in fact, marketed to day traders. As the advertisements say, now you can trade the S&P 500 all day long in real time. I can't help likening the ETF, a cleverly designed financial instrument, to the renowned Purdy shotgun, supposedly the world's best. It's great for big game hunting in Africa, but it's also excellent for suicide. I suspect that too many ETFs will prove, if not suicidal to their owners in financial terms, at least wealth depleting. We know that ETFs are largely used by traders. That 3600% annual turnover of spider shares, for example, compares to the typical 15% turnover in the shares of that original Vanguard 500 index fund in recent years. The share turnover for the NASDAQ cubes is even higher, at 6,000% per year. It's only guesswork, but perhaps 20% of the $90 billion assets of these spider-like broadly diversified ETFs is held by long-term investors, or about $18 billion. The remaining assets, I presume, are held by arbitrageurs and market makers, making heavy use of short selling and hedging strategies. Thus, more than $300 billion of the $330 billion ETF base represents a vast departure from the beneficial attributes of the original index fund. Trading in other types of ETFs is also remarkably high. The shares of the larger sector fund ETFs are typically turned over at an average annual rate of some 200 percent per year, an average holding period of just six months, with the most popular ones running turnover rates from 578 percent to 735 percent, all the way up to 7100 percent, Russell 2000 I shares, and 8500 percent, SPDR Energy shares. Could there be speculation going on here? Yes, specialized ETFs are diversified, but only in their narrow arenas. Owning the semiconductor industry is not diversification in any usual sense, nor is owning the South Korean stock market. And while sector ETFs themselves frequently have the lowest expense ratios in their fields, they could run three to six times the level of the lowest cost all market index funds. 
What is more, sector ETFs carry not only brokerage and trading costs, but are often sold as parts of actively managed fund portfolios with advisor fees of 1% or more, or in wrap accounts with annual fees of 1.5% to 2% or more. The net result of these differences is that sector ETFs as a group are virtually certain to provide returns that fall well short of the returns delivered by the stock market. Perhaps 1% to 3% a year is a fair estimate of these all-in costs. Many times the 10 to 20 basis point cost of the best classic index funds. It is not a trivial difference, for no matter how often derided or ignored, the tautology remains that sector funds must and will earn a net return equal to the gross return of that sector, less intermediation costs. A double whammy. Betting on sectors as they grow hot, emotions, and paying heavy trading commissions and fees, expenses, are sure to be hazardous to your wealth. But whatever returns each sector ETF itself may earn, the investors in those very ETFs will likely, if not certainly, earn returns that fall well behind them. For there is abundant evidence that the most popular sector funds of the day are those that have recently enjoyed the most spectacular recent performance, and that such, after-the-fact popularity, is a recipe for unsuccessful investing. The lesson we learned in Chapter 5, that mutual fund investors almost always do significantly worse than the funds they own, is almost certain to be repeated in ETFs. And because the ETFs focus on ever narrower market segments and trade at a far more rapid rate, the damage is apt to be far worse. To illustrate this point, let's look at the record of the 107 ETFs with three-year records through 2006. The actual returns earned by their investors lag the returns reported by the funds themselves in 66 cases, nearly two-thirds of the list. In many cases, the lag exceeded 10% of return per year, a loss of capital equal to some 30% of the amount invested in them. The Spider Materials ETF sector took the cake, with a gap of 30.3% per year. The sector earned a positive return of 16%, while its investors suffered an annual loss of 14.3%. For investors in the Russell 1000 Index ETF, the negative gap was 17% per year. The MS Technology Index ETF, 11.9%. The Taiwan Index, 10.9%. In the Semiconductor ETF, 10.8%. And the Midcap Growth Index ETF, 10.7%. Handle with care should be the first warning on the ETF label, though I have yet to see it used. And so we have a double whammy. The near inevitability of counterproductive market timing, emotions, as investors bet on sectors as they grow hot and bet against them when they grow cold, combined with those heavy trading commissions and fees, expenses. Together, these two enemies of the equity investor are sure to be hazardous to your wealth, to say nothing of consuming giant globs of your time that could easily be used in more productive and enjoyable ways. The explosive emergence of the ETF from its humble beginnings in 1992 to its prominent status today has been a boon to fund managers, investment advisors, financial entrepreneurs, arbitrageurs, speculators and traders. In 2006, ETFs were also at the cutting edge of a variety of the kind of market-beating strategies, at least in retrospect, described in the previous chapter. The choice of the ETF structure by these entrepreneurs, rather than the standard mutual fund format, would seem to belie the fact that their fundamental indexing approach may take decades to prove itself, if indeed it does so at all. These new indexes, as noted in the previous chapter, are based not on traditional market capitalization weighted indexes, that is, S&P 500, Dow Jones Wilshire Total U.S. Stock Market, but on fundamental factors such as dividends, or some combination of revenues, profits, cash flow, etc. These ETFs describe themselves as the new paradigm and promise, or at least strongly imply, that they will outpace the classic index fund. Yet by choosing the ETF format, they imply even more strongly that actively buying and selling the funds will lead to even larger short-term profits. 
All things considered, the burgeoning growth of ETFs is an entrepreneur's dream come true. They offer the excitement of a new idea, massive publicity, and the marketing flexibility of the fund industry's asset gatherers to focus on whatever sectors are hot and whatever strategies have paid off in the recent past. All the better to attract the capital of performance-hungry investors. Not only do ETFs generate soaring assets and soaring fees to the managers, but active trading in ETF shares generates heavy sales commissions for brokers. But is it too much to ask whether these index funds nouveau are an investor's dream come true? Do investors really benefit from the ability to trade ETFs all day long in real time? Is less diversification better than more diversification? Is trend following a winner's game or a loser's game? Are ETFs truly low cost when we compare their expense ratios, much lower than actively managed funds, but generally many times higher than the leading traditional index funds, with the sales commissions paid to brokers on each transaction? Is buy and sell, often with great frequency, really a better strategy than buy and hold? The classic index fund was designed to capitalize on the wisdom of long-term investing, holding the market portfolio for an investment lifetime with the broadest possible diversification at the lowest reasonable operating expense, minimal portfolio turnover costs, the absence of sales loads, and optimal tax efficiency. What can we say of these index funds nouveau? In general, they offer far less diversification, far more operating expenses, repeated sales commissions, and, for the lucky investor who trades them profitably, substantial tax inefficiencies compared with their classic predecessors. Held for only a few years, or even a few weeks or months, and often chasing bygone performance, investors in these index funds nouveau are too often engaging in the folly of short-term speculation. On the broad spectrum that lies between advancing the interests of the business and the interests of the clients, where do ETFs fit? If you are making a single large initial purchase of either of those two versions of classic indexing, the Spider or the Vanguard Total Stock Market ETF, at a low commission rate and holding them for the long term, you'll profit from the low expense ratio and may even enjoy a bit of extra tax efficiency. This is the very indexing strategy that is the theme of this book. But if you trade them, you're ignoring the relentless rules of humble arithmetic that are the key to successful investing. If you like the idea of sector ETFs, use the appropriate ones. Don't trade them, and use them in the right way, sparingly, and only to diversify your portfolio. Let me now answer the question I asked at the outset of this chapter. What have they done to my song, Ma? As the creator of the world's first index fund all those years ago, I can only answer. They've tied it up in a plastic bag and turned it upside down, Ma. That's what they've done to my song. In short, the ETF is a traitor to the cause of classic indexing. I urge intelligent investors to stay on the course with a proven strategy. While I can't say that classic indexing is the best strategy ever devised, I can reassure you that the number of strategies that are worse is infinite. Don't take my word for it. Listen to what Don Phillips, Managing Director of Morningstar, has to say. Indexing has served investors well, but there is a dark side to indexing that investors should not ignore. The potential for harm to investors increases as index offerings become more specialized, which is exactly what has happened in the world of ETFs, which have progressively become more costly and more volatile over the past decade. In the right hands, Precision tools can create great things. In the wrong ones, however, they can do considerable damage. As ETFs become increasingly more potent, the penalty for their misuse grows more extreme. In creating more complex offerings, the index community has found new revenue sources from very specialized tools, but it has done so at the risk of doing considerable harm to less sophisticated investors. The test of character facing the index community is whether it ignores that risk or steps up and tries to mitigate it. The continued good name of indexing lies in the balance. From Jim Wyant, editor of the Journal of Indexing.
I have always found it ironic that indexing, like most everything else in the world of finance, comes in waves. In an early article I wrote in this publication, I noted that a careful comparison of returns and fund inflows showed that even asset growth in the erstwhile Vanguard 500 was driven by investors chasing returns. Hedge fund indexes, microcap indexes, dividend indexes, commodities indexes, China indexes, and enhanced indexes are all flavors of the month. And I'll give you three guesses as to what all of these indexes have in common. One, chasing returns. Two, chasing returns. Or three, chasing returns. And this move toward enhanced indexing. Call me a cynic, but if you believe in indexing, then you know there is no free money. And you've got to believe that active is active. It's only a matter of degree. Ultimately, the push toward enhanced indexing is about enhancing the bottom line for managers, something all the major index players have been doing with great success of late. But it's important for us to keep our eyes on the ball and remember what makes indexing, well, indexing. Low fees, broad diversification, hold, hold, hold. Don't believe the hype. Try to beat the market in any manner and you're likely to get beat by about the cost of doing it. And now listen carefully to the warnings from two senior officers of one of the major sponsors of ETFs. Chief Executive. For most people, sector funds don't make a lot of sense. Don't stray too far from the market's course. Chief Investment Officer. It would be unfortunate if people focused pinpoint bets on very narrowly defined ETFs. These still involve nearly as much risk as concentrating on individual stock picks. You're taking extraordinary risk. It's possible to take a good thing too far. How many people really need them? Chapter 16 What would Benjamin Graham have thought about indexing? You heard it here. The first edition of The Intelligent Investor was published in 1949. It was written by Benjamin Graham, the most respected money manager of the day, and co-author, with David Dodd, of Security Analysis, a remarkable and scholarly tome originally published in 1934. Whether or not The Intelligent Investor was the first book of its kind, it was surely the best, comprehensive, analytical, perceptive, and forthright. A book for the ages. While Benjamin Graham is best known by far for his focus on the kind of value investing represented by the category of stocks he describes as bargain issues, he cautioned that the aggressive investor must have a considerable knowledge of security values, enough, in fact, to warrant viewing his security operations as equivalent to a business enterprise. It follows from this reasoning that the majority of security owners should elect the defensive classification. Why? because the majority of investors do not have the time or the determination or the mental equipment to embark upon such investing as a quasi-business. They should therefore be satisfied with the reasonably good return obtainable from a defensive portfolio, and they should stoutly resist the recurrent temptation to increase this return by deviating into other paths. While the index fund was not even imagined in 1949, he was certainly describing the very approach that this precedent-setting fund would later follow. Coincidentally, it was also in 1949 that an article in Fortune magazine introduced me to the mutual fund industry, inspiring me to write my 1951 Princeton senior thesis on mutual funds. In my thesis, I even hinted at the index fund idea, writing that, mutual funds can make no claim to superiority over the market averages. For the defensive investor who required assistance, Graham originally recommended professional investment advisors who rely on normal investment experience for the results and who make no claim to being brilliant but pride themselves on being careful, conservative, and competent, whose chief value to their clients is in shielding them from costly mistakes. He cautioned about expecting too much from stock exchange houses arguing that while the Wall Street brokerage fraternity has probably the highest ethical standards of any business, it is still feeling its way toward the high standards and standing of a profession. A half century later, the quest remains far from complete. He also noted, profoundly if obviously, that Wall Street is in business to make commissions, 
and that the way to succeed in business is to give customers what they want. Trying hard to make money in a field where they are condemned almost by mathematical law to lose. Later on, in 1976, Graham described his opinion of Wall Street as highly unfavorable, a Falstaffian joke that frequently degenerates into a madhouse, a huge laundry in which institutions take in large blocks of each other's washing. Shades of Harvard's Jack Meyer, from whom we have earlier heard, and Yale's David Swenson, whom you'll meet in the next chapter. In that first edition of The Intelligent Investor, Graham commended the use by investors of leading investment funds as an alternative to creating their own portfolios. He thought the term investment trust was inaccurate and the term investment company ambiguous. Of course, he was describing what we now have come to know as mutual funds, though that term too is ambiguous and far from forthright. Graham described the well-established mutual funds of his era as competently managed, making fewer mistakes than the typical small investor, carrying a reasonable expense, and performing a sound function by acquiring and holding an adequately diversified list of common stocks. But he was bluntly realistic about what fund managers might accomplish. He illustrated this point in his book with data showing that during 1937 to 1947, when the Standard & Poor's 500 index provided a total return of 57%, the average mutual fund produced a total return of 54%, excluding the oppressive impact of sales loads. The more things change, the more they remain the same. Graham's conclusion, the figures are not very impressive in either direction. On the whole, the managerial ability of invested funds has been just about able to absorb the expense burden and the drag of uninvested cash. In 1949, of course, fund expenses and turnover costs were far lower than in the modern fund industry. That change explains why, as fund returns were overwhelmed by these costs in the recent era, the figures for recent decades were impressive only in a negative direction. In a later edition of The Intelligent Investor, written in 1965, Graham's confidence that funds would produce the market's return, less costs, was somewhat shaken. Unsoundly managed funds, he noted, can produce spectacular but largely illusionary profits for a while, followed inevitably by calamitous losses. He was describing the so-called performance funds of the mid-1960s go-go era, in which a new breed that had a spectacular knack for coming up with winners, managed by bright, energetic young people, promised to perform miracles with other people's money, but who have inevitably brought losses to their public in the end. He could have as easily been presciently describing the hundreds of risky new economy mutual funds formed during the great bull market of 1998 to 2000 and their utter collapse in the subsequent 50% market crash that, doubtless inevitably, followed. Graham also would have been appalled, not only by the enormous 100% plus increase in those once reasonable fund expenses, but also by the incredible increase in stock trading by mutual fund managers. During Graham's era, portfolio turnover ran to about 15% per year. It now averages more than 100%. Graham would surely and accurately have described such an approach as rank speculation that flies directly in the face of his deeply held investment principles. His timeless lesson for the intelligent investor, as valid today as when he prescribed it in his first edition, is clear. The real money in investment will have to be made, as most of it has been made in the past, not out of buying and selling, but of owning and holding securities, receiving interest and dividends and increases in value. His philosophy has been reflected over and over again in this book, exemplified in the parable of the Gottrocks family in Chapter 1, and the distinction between the business market and the expectations market in Chapter 2. Owning and holding a diversified list of securities? Wouldn't Graham recommend a fund that essentially buys the entire U.S. stock market and holds it forever? Patiently receiving interest in dividends and increases in value, doesn't his buy-and-hold philosophy, as well as his admonition to strictly adhere to standard, conservative, and even unimaginative forms of investment, eerily echo the concept of market indexing? When he advises the defensive investor to let it, 
choosing the best stocks alone and emphasize diversification more than individual selection. Hasn't Benjamin Graham come within inches of describing the modern-day stock index fund? Late in his life, in an interview published in the Financial Analyst Journal in September-October 1976, Graham candidly acknowledged the inevitable failure of individual investment managers to outpace the market. Again, coincidentally, the interview took place at the very moment that the public offering of the world's first mutual index fund, First Index Investment Trust, now Vanguard 500 Index Fund, was taking place. He was asked, can the average manager obtain better results than the Standard & Poor's Index over the years? Graham's blunt response, no. Then he explained, in effect, that would mean that the stock market experts as a whole could beat themselves, a logical contradiction. The interviewer's next question was whether investors should be content with earning the market's return. Graham's answer, yes. Not only that, but I think they should require approximately such results over, say, a moving five-year average period as a condition for paying standard management fees to advisors. All these years later, the idea that earning your fair share of the market's return is the winning strategy is the central theme of this little book. Only the classic index fund can guarantee that outcome. Finally, he was asked about the objection made against the index fund, that different investors have different requirements. Again, Graham responded bluntly. At bottom, that is only a convenient cliché or alibi to justify the mediocre record of the past. All investors want good results from their investments and are entitled to them to the extent that they are actually obtainable. I see no reason why they should be content with results inferior to those of an indexed fund or pay standard fees for such inferior results. More than half a century ago, in his introduction to The Intelligent Investor, Benjamin Graham cautioned that many of the financial instruments of his day would not likely stand the test of future developments. What he expected would survive were the rules that apply mainly to human nature and human conduct. Copybook maxims such as, if you speculate, you will most probably lose your money in the end. Rely on the time-tested principle of insurance with wide diversification of risk. While the name Benjamin Graham is intimately connected, indeed almost synonymous with value investing and the search for undervalued securities, his classic book, in fact, gives far more attention to the down-to-earth basics of portfolio policy. The straightforward, uncomplicated principles of diversification and rational long-term expectations, two of the overarching themes of the little book you are now reading. Then to solving the sphinx-like riddle of selecting superior stocks through careful security analysis. To achieve satisfactory investment results is easier than most people realize. To achieve superior results is harder than it looks. It is fair to say that, by Graham's demanding standards, the overwhelming majority of today's mutual funds, largely because of their high costs and speculative behavior, have failed to live up to their promise. As a result, a new type of fund, the index fund, is now gradually moving toward ascendancy. Why? Both because of what it does, providing the broadest possible diversification, and because of what it doesn't do, neither assessing high costs nor engaging in high turnover. These paraphrases of Graham's copybook maxims are an important part of his legacy to that vast majority of shareholders whom he believed should follow the principles he outlined for the defensive investor. What's more, Graham was well aware that the superior rewards he had reaped using his valuation principles would be difficult to achieve in the future, in his 1976 interview, he made this remarkable concession. I am no longer an advocate of elaborate techniques of security analysis in order to find superior value opportunities. This was a rewarding activity, say, 40 years ago. But the situation has changed a great deal since then. In the old days, any well-trained security analyst could do a good professional job of selecting undervalued issues through detailed studies. But in the light of the enormous amount of research now being carried on, I doubt whether in most cases such extensive efforts will generate sufficiently superior selections to justify their cost. 
To that very limited extent, I'm on the side of the efficient market school of thought, now generally accepted by the professors. It is Benjamin Graham's common sense, clear thinking, simplicity, and sense of financial history, along with his willingness to hold fast to the sound principles of long-term investing, even as he was willing to change with the times with respect to the types of securities employed, few of which were more dramatic than the development of the index fund, that constitute his lasting legacy. He sums up his advice. Fortunately for the typical investor, it is by no means necessary for his success that he bring the time-honored qualities of courage, knowledge, judgment, and experience to bear upon his program, provided he limits his ambition to his capacity and confines his activities within the safe and narrow path of standard defensive investment. To achieve satisfactory investment results is easier than most people realize. To achieve superior results is harder than it looks. When it's so easy, in fact unbelievably simple, to capture the stock market's returns through an index fund, you don't need to take the extra risks and wasteful costs involved in striving for superior results. With Benjamin Graham's long perspective, hard realism, clear thinking, and wise intellect, there's no doubt whatsoever in my mind that he would have applauded the index fund. Don't take my word for it. While Benjamin Graham's unequivocal written commentary can be easily read as an endorsement of a low-cost all-stock market index fund, don't take my word for it. Listen instead to Warren Buffett, his collaborator, whose counsel and practical aid Graham acknowledged as invaluable in the final edition of The Intelligent Investor. In 1993, Buffett, Graham's protege and collaborator, unequivocally endorsed the index fund. In 2006, he not only reaffirmed this endorsement, but assured me that, decades earlier, Graham had in fact endorsed the index funds. Here, Mr. Buffett. A low-cost index fund is the most sensible equity investment for the great majority of investors. My mentor, Ben Graham, took this position many years ago, and everything I have seen since convinces me of its truth. I can only add, after Forrest Gump, and that's all I have to say about that. Chapter 17 The Relentless Rules of Humble Arithmetic Reprise If the message in this book comes across as confident, please remember that my confidence in the index fund is buttressed by the conclusions of many of the smartest, most experienced, most successful investors in America, including Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Benjamin Graham, along with top academics and endowment managers, Nobel laureates Paul Samuelson, William Sharp, and Daniel Kahneman, and Princeton's Burton Melchiel, Yale's David Swenson, Harvard's Jack Meyer, and MIT's Andrew Lowe. To these independent experts, add fund industry insiders like Magellan's Peter Lynch, former investment company institute chairman John Fossil, Philadelphia money manager Ted Aronson, fund supermarket king Charles Schwab, and analyst Mark Holbert. Then heed the similar advice of financial journalists from Tyler Matheson and Jason Zweig of Money Magazine to the Economist of London and Jonathan Clements and Holman Jenkins Jr. of the Wall Street Journal. Perhaps even more important, don't forget the convictions of intelligent investors hundreds of corporate and government pension funds and millions of individuals from the very wealthy to the man on the street who have put their money where their mouth is investing some five trillion dollars in index strategies that confidence is further buttressed by simply looking at the record as you've seen in chapter after chapter that record confirms the superiority of indexing by a wide margin over the average stock fund and the average bond fund as well, and by an even wider margin over the average fund investor. Further, the superiority of the index fund is based not on the fleeting accomplishments of a tiny handful of funds, often achieved by money managers who ceased managing the fund's portfolios years earlier, but on the permanent accomplishments of an all-market strategy where no money manager even enters the picture. Truly, the classic index fund is the only mutual fund you can hold forever. 
as the great economist John Maynard Keynes warned earlier in a different context. Historical returns are of no value unless we can explain the source of those returns. In this context, let me reiterate. The two basic sources of the superior returns achieved by the index fund are 1. The broadest possible diversification, eliminating individual stock risk, style risk, and manager risk, with only market risk remaining, and 2. The tiniest possible costs and minimal taxes. Together, they enable the index fund to provide the gross return earned in the stock market minus a scintilla of cost. Regular equity mutual funds as a group also provide, as they must, a gross return equal to the average return of the market. Today, holding almost 30% of all U.S. stocks, they trade largely with one another, enriching on balance only the brokers who receive the commissions on their vigorous trading of portfolio securities, and who also happen to sell their shares, and the management companies that control them. And as a result, impoverishing, as it were, the net returns the funds deliver to their investors. Fund investment managers, distributors, marketers, administrators, brokers, and investment bankers have garnered staggering rewards. But the high prices they charge for their services, the transaction costs on their high turnover policies, and the excessive taxes that their investors incur have siphoned off an enormous portion of the high real returns provided by the stock market in the past. With the modest real returns on stocks that seem almost destined to prevail in the future, discussed in Chapter 7, those same huge rewards to those in the fund business will confiscate an even larger share, indeed the lion's share, of the stock market's return. It is as certain as the rising and setting of the sun that in the years ahead, the large cost advantage that exists for the index fund will continue. Price competition among index funds will keep the expense ratios of the low-cost providers at a minuscule level. On the other hand, marketing competition among the giant financial conglomerates that now hold dominion over the fund industry, the drive for profits to the owners of mutual fund management companies, and demands by brokers for extra payments to compensate them for their marketing efforts, will create strong pressure to maintain the high fee revenues generated by their actively managed funds, where, tragically, investors too often ignore the baneful impact of the fees that they pay. Yes, it is at least theoretically possible that the fund industry will at last turn from its present competition to raise prices and serve the interest of fund sellers to a new competition to cut prices and serve the interest of fund buyers. But it's impossible to imagine that the huge gap between the all-in costs of the index fund and the all-in costs of the average equity fund a gap that is now nearly two and a half percentage points per year, will be significantly reduced. And even if the gap were slashed by one half to one and a quarter percentage points, which will only happen to use a wonderful barnyard metaphor for the inconceivable when pigs finally whistle, the classic index fund would remain the investment of choice. There's no similar guarantee that fund investors will continue to suffer the additional loss of return that they have incurred in the past through the twin penalties of market timing and fund selection, an additional gap of some three percentage points per year. However, if investors finally realize the error of their ways and remove the negative impact of their counterproductive emotions from the equation, that awesome loss could be substantially reduced in the years ahead. At some point, after all, smart investors ought to figure out for themselves that pouring money into hot funds in hot markets and pulling money out of those funds when they turn cool, often in cold markets, is a loser's game. Further, if fund managers finally lay off the creation and promotion of the fund of the moment, that gap between the return earned by fund investors and the returns reported by the funds themselves could shrink in the years ahead. On the other hand, with the craze in trading ETFs, including those actively managed ETFs, that modestly describe themselves as the new paradigm, the gap could get even larger. Whatever the case, it seems set in stone that a substantial gap will continue to exist. As noted in Chapter 5, for example, among the 200 equity funds with the largest cash inflows from 1996 to 2000, only two, a minuscule 1%, enjoyed investor dollar-weighted returns 
that exceeded the fund's reported per share time-weighted return. During the past decade on average, investors in these funds earned a return of just 2.4% per year, a shortfall of 6.4 percentage points to the 8.8% return reported by the funds they own, an enormous gap of 73% in annual return. Interestingly, the two funds eking out positive margins, only a minuscule 0.05 and 0.5 percentage points, were terrible performers, and thus largely immune to the enthusiasm of performance chasing by investors. If you expect a substantial reversal of that trend, I would simply warn, don't count on it. But above all, I'm confident about the long-term success that lies in store both for sound investment in business and for the classic index fund and those who invest in it, because virtually the entire case that I present is based on the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. Lest we forget, let me again take you through these rules. 1. Over the long term, stock market returns are created by real investment returns earned by real businesses. The annual dividend yield on publicly held U.S. corporations plus their subsequent rate of earnings growth. 2. Over the short run, illusory speculative returns, born of the impact of the change in the amount investors are willing to pay for each dollar of corporate earnings, can increase or decrease investment returns. But in the long run, their effect washes out. QED number 1. In investing, the winning strategy for reaping the rewards of capitalism depends on owning businesses, not trading stocks. 3. Individual businesses have come and gone in the past. Given the rapid pace of technological change we face today, along with the powerful new competition provided by globalization, the failure rate of individual corporations is hardly likely to falter. 4. The best protection for individual investors from the risks inherent in individual stocks is diversification. QED number 2. Owning all U.S. businesses through an all-market index fund is the consummate risk reduction strategy. Broad economic risks to corporate earnings and dividends, however, cannot be diversified away. 5. As a group, all investors in the stock market earn its gross returns. When the market provides an 8% return, investors divide up 8% before taking account of costs. What else is new? 6. While investors earn the market's entire return, they do not capture the market's entire return. Rather, they capture the market's return only after the costs of financial intermediation are deducted. Commissions, management fees, marketing costs, sales loads, administrative expenses, legal expenses, and custodial fees, etc. Unnecessary taxes simply make the gap larger. QED number 3. Gross market return minus costs equals net return for investors as a group. Remember the Gottrocks family. 7. While all investors as a group must earn the market's net return, mutual fund investors, betrayed by their emotions and by the fund industry, into serious error in market timing and fund selection have done much worse. While it is possible that gap may shrink, it is virtually inconceivable that it will be eliminated. QED number 4. Gross market return minus costs minus timing and selection penalties equals the net return earned by mutual fund investors as a group. Let me remind you again of the four E's described in Chapter 5. The two greatest enemies of the equity fund investor are expenses and emotions. In that context, the index fund is the investment of choice, importantly because all of the other choices have serious problems. These problems begin, of course, with the grossly excessive costs that overwhelm the ability of all but the ablest or luckiest fund managers to outpace the index fund. But they don't end there, for the mutual fund industry has created for itself other problems that are wholly counterproductive to the interests of the investors that it seeks to serve. These problems include the industry's very structure in which managers control the funds that they serve under contract, 
Mutual funds themselves are required under the law to be governed by boards of directors with a majority of independent members, unaffiliated with the management company. While common sense would suggest that the owners of the fund should be in the driver's seat of fund operations, they are consigned to the rumble seat, essentially powerless and voiceless. The overriding drive among fund managers for asset size, seemingly above all else, simply because assets piled on assets results in fees piled on fees. Yet the record is clear that when small and mid-sized funds capitalize on their flexibility and succeed in generating exceptional returns, they draw immense cash flows and become giant-sized funds that are muscle-bound and inflexible, bound to a return that parallels the stock market before costs, pinned to the earth, as it were, like Gulliver. The worship of the great god market share not only demands the preeminence of aggressive and costly marketing, promotional and advertising efforts to build existing funds, easiest to do with those that have provided superior returns in the past, but to bring out new funds with each change in the market environment. And so we had go-go funds in the 1960s, favorite 50 proven growth stocks funds in the 1970s, government plus funds in the 1980s, and of course, New economy funds, notably in technology, telecommunications, or Internet stocks, in the late 1990s. Today, the popular favorites include real estate funds, emerging market funds, and commodity funds. And we've added a whole new fill-up. The ability to trade these funds all day long in real time via the increasingly popular ETFs. No business can forever ignore the interest of its clients. The fund industry was able to do so during the 1980s and 1990s only because it was blessed with the powerful tailwind of financial markets that provided the highest returns in all history, 18% from stocks, 80% above the long-term average of 10%, 10% from bonds, 100% above the long-term average of 5%. But while investors seem willing to accept the loss of a few percentage points from those enormous returns, if they were even aware of the impact of those all-in costs, they surely will not do so in the environment of sharply lower returns on stocks and bonds alike that seem certain in the years ahead. And as investors come to rely on a measurement benchmark based not on nominal returns, but on real returns, they will be even more skeptical about the ability of the fund industry to serve their interests. The fund industry finally will be hoist on its own petard, an explosion created by the lethal mix of a flawed governance structure with a failed industry mission, the unremitting aim to build enormous assets through opportunistic marketing and new product adventurism, all lumped on top of costs which cannot possibly be recouped by superior performance. After all, in a brutish world peopled by smart, educated, experienced, and professional money managers who are competing with one another, Managers as a group are inevitably consigned to averageness before costs and after costs are deducted, destined to be losers. Remember, O oh stranger, that arithmetic is the first of the sciences. The mutual fund industry has forgotten that simple rule. Unless it changes, the industry will begin a long decline, condemned to its fate by its willingness, even its eagerness, to ignore the relentless rules of humble arithmetic. The passively managed index fund is destined to become an even more formidable competitor to its actively managed rivals. Don't take my word for it. Listen first to David Swenson, Chief Investment Officer at Yale University. Invest in low turnover passively managed index funds and stay away from profit-driven investment management organizations. The mutual fund industry is a colossal failure resulting from its systematic exploitation of individual investors, as funds extract enormous sums from investors in exchange for providing a shocking disservice. Excessive management fees take their toll, and manager profits dominate fiduciary responsibility. Then listen to Holman Jenkins, Jr. of the Wall Street Journal. Will customers keep supporting the enormous overhead required to sustain ineffectual, unproductive stock picking across an array of thousands of individual funds devoted to every investing style and economic sector or regional subgroup that some marketing idiot can dream up? Not likely. A brutal shakeout is coming, 
and one of its revelations will be that stock picking is a grossly overrated piece of the puzzle, that cost control is what distinguishes a competitive firm from an uncompetitive one. And finally, listen to Nobel Laureate in Economics, Princeton Professor Daniel Kahneman. His life's work explains that investors are prone to overconfidence, and how that overconfidence causes us to misinterpret information and let our emotions warp our judgment. When it comes to investing, I don't try to be clever at all. The idea that I could see what no one else can is an illusion. So he sticks with, yes, index funds. But for simple pros, hear this unmistakable endorsement from Warren Buffett. By periodically investing in an index fund, the know-nothing investor can actually outperform most investment professionals. Paradoxically, when dumb money acknowledges its limitations, it ceases to be dumb. Those index funds that are very low cost are investor-friendly by definition and are the best selection for most of those who wish to own equities. Chapter 18 What Should I Do Now? Funny Money, Serious Money, and Investment Strategy Deep down, I remain absolutely confident that the vast majority of American families will be well served by owning their equity holdings in an all-U.S. stock market index portfolio and holding their bonds in an all-U.S. bond market index portfolio. Investors in high tax brackets, however, would hold a very low-cost, quasi-index portfolio of high-grade intermediate-term municipal bonds. While such an index-driven strategy may not be the best investment strategy ever devised, the number of investment strategies that are worse is infinite. The rationale for a 100% index fund portfolio remains solid as a rock. But I also fear, and again deep down, that very few investors will follow that approach, the very essence of simplicity for their entire investment portfolio. You must now be as exhausted as I am by the unremitting pounding of the theme that simplicity is the answer and that complexity simply doesn't work. But we investors seem all too willing to ignore the verities described in this book. Instead of index funds, we opt for costly active funds and trade them to excess. Why? We are sold funds more often than we buy them. We have far too much self-confidence. We crave excitement. We succumb to the distraction that is the stock market. We fail to understand the arithmetic of investing and the arithmetic of mutual funds. I have no ability to tell you whether betting on managers who pursue active investment strategies will win or lose in the future, but I can guarantee you that it hasn't worked very well in the past. To be sure, there are lots of smart, engaging, purposeful money managers and financial advisors. And all that activity that seems endemic to the investment business will be exciting and enticing. But after all is said and done, you'll find that there are no surefire solutions for investment success, wealth without risk, if you will. It's just not a realistic expectation. Nonetheless, building an investment portfolio can be exciting, and trying out modern remedies for age-old problems lets you exercise your animal spirits. If you crave excitement, I would encourage you to do exactly that. Life is short. If you want to enjoy the fun, enjoy. But whatever you do, maintain the index fund as the core of your program. That core should represent at least 50% of your invested assets. In fact, my recommendation is that the core represent at least 95% of your assets. Consider that your serious money account. What about your funny money account? I would put not one penny more than 5% of your investment assets into the funny money account. Enjoy the fun of gambling and the thrill of the chase, but not with your rent money, and certainly not with college education funds for your children, nor with your retirement nest egg. Yes, test, if you will, two or three aggressive investment strategies. You're likely to learn some valuable lessons, and it probably won't hurt you too much in the short term. Here are some funny money approaches and my advice about using them. 1. Individual stocks? Yes. Pick a few. Listen to the promoters. Listen to your broker or advisor. Listen to your neighbors. Heck, even listen to your brother-in-law. 2. 
actively manage mutual funds? Yes, but only if they are run by managers who own their own firms, who follow distinctive philosophies, and who invest for the long term without benchmark hugging. Don't be surprised if the managed fund loses to the index fund one year of every three. 3. Closet index funds whose returns are tied closely to the returns of the stock market and which carry excessive costs? No. 4. ETFs? Those that track defined industry sectors that exclude the field in which the family breadwinner earns his or her living? Maybe. Those that hold the classic index portfolio? Yes. But in the serious money account? But whatever the case, don't speculate in ETFs. Invest in them. 5. Commodity funds? No. Of course, there will be commodity bubbles, which will attract you only after they have inflated to absurd proportions. But unlike stocks and bonds, commodities have no fundamentals to support them, that is, neither earnings and dividends nor interest payments. 6. Hedge funds? No. Too much hype. Too much diffusion of performance among winners and losers. Too many different strategies. Too many successful managers who won't accept your money. Too much tax inefficiency. And surprise, management fees that are so high as to destroy even the small chance you have of winning. Hedge funds, it is said, are not an investment strategy, but a compensation strategy. 7. Hedge funds of funds? No. Really no. If a hedge fund is too expensive, just imagine a fund of funds that lays on a whole other layer of expenses. If you decide to have a funny money account, be sure to measure your returns after one year, after five years, and after ten years. Then, compare those returns with the returns you've earned in your serious money account. I'm betting that your serious money will win in a landslide. If it does, you can then decide whether all that fun was adequate compensation for the potential wealth you've relinquished. Fun, finally, may be a fair enough purpose for your funny money account. But how, you ask, should you invest your serious money account? That 50% to 95% of your assets on which you now depend or will one day depend for your comforts of human existence. Use an index fund strategy. Even better, Use it for 100% of your assets. The fact that few of you are likely to go that far doesn't mean it isn't the best strategy. Most investors, both institutional and individual, will find that the best way to own common stocks is through an index fund that charges minimal fees. Those following this path are sure to beat the net results, after fees and expenses, delivered by the great majority of investment professionals. If Warren Buffett says it, as he did, it's surely worth listening to. Indexing is also, for most investors, the best way to own bonds. I favor the pristine and classic all-U.S. stock market and all-bond market approach. But there are perfectly reasonable alternative strategies for supplementing the index funds in your serious money portfolio. Kept within limits, here are some acceptable variations. Given the limitations of my space and your attention span, I'll deal with each in a cursory manner here. But further study on your part will be rewarded. An International Flavor While international businesses comprise about 25% of the revenues and profits of U.S. corporations, many investors seek a larger global participation. Although foreign stocks account for about one-half of the world's market capitalization, I recommend that they account for no more than about 20% of your own equity portfolio. By far, the soundest way to acquire that participation is to hold, no surprise here, a low-cost total international index fund that tracks the returns of all non-U.S. corporations. A modest holding in a low-cost emerging market index fund is also a reasonable approach. Slice and Dice Impressed by both the long-term performance and recent performance of value stocks and small-cap stocks, some investors hold the all-market or S&P 500 index fund as the core and add a value index fund and a small-cap index fund as satellites. I'm skeptical that any kind of superior performance will endure forever. 
Nothing does. But if you disagree, it would not be unreasonable to hold, say, 85% in the core, another 10% in value, and another 5% in small cap. But don't push too far in increasing the risk that your return will fall short of the market's return. Bond Strategy The all-U.S. bond market portfolio remains the bond investment of choice. It holds investment-grade corporate bonds, mortgage-backed securities, and U.S. Treasuries, and has an intermediate-term maturity in the range of 5 to 10 years. Yet we all differ in our liquidity preferences, income requirements, and tolerance for volatility. Combining a mix of index funds linked to short-term, intermediate-term, and long-term bonds in varying amounts is a sound way of honoring these preferences. I don't recommend money market funds in this mix. They are for savings, not for investment, but rather favor the use of short-term bond funds for investors who lean toward greater short-term stability of principal and, in return, are willing to accept less durability of income over the long term. Inflation Protection Bond investors should carefully consider the use of inflation-linked bonds in their accounts. The U.S. Treasury offers these bonds in various maturities, each of which pays a basic interest rate, currently about 2.4% on the 10-year Treasury note, plus the current rate of inflation, about 2.4%. This all-in yield totals 4.8%, the same as the regular 10-year Treasury. The difference is that if inflation rises, or for that matter, falls, the total return that you earn will reflect the change. Since the Treasury note is deemed risk-free, there is no need for the diversification of an index fund. If you prefer a bond fund owning inflation-linked bonds, choose only the very lowest-cost funds. In effect, an index strategy. Asset Allocation How much in stocks? How much in bonds? Asset allocation is almost universally considered the most important determinant of the long-term investment return you will earn. Most of us will want more stocks when we're young, have relatively small assets at stake, many years to recoup losses, and do not depend upon investment income. When we're older, we're likely to prefer more bonds, for if we've planned intelligently and invested wisely, our asset accumulations have grown to substantial size. We have far less time on our side. And, when retired, we will rely on our portfolios to produce a steady and continuing stream of income. My favorite rule of thumb is roughly to hold a bond position equal to your age. 20% when you are 20, 70% when you're 70, etc. There are no hard and fast rules here. Most experts think my guidelines are too conservative, but I am conservative. Balanced Index Funds Since the formation of the first balanced index fund in 1990, 60% total U.S. stock market, 40% total U.S. bond market, a whole variety of variations on that theme have been created. First came life strategy funds, each with a fixed allocation ranging from roughly 20% to 80% in stocks, often with a moderate international allocation, and the remainder in U.S. bonds. More recently, target funds have come to the fore. Here, investors can begin with an allocation appropriate to their age, which inches gradually toward a more conservative allocation as they approach the retirement age they have targeted. Such gradual rebalancing makes considerable sense. Essentially, your allocation strategy is on automatic pilot for your lifetime. The most effective way to implement the strategy is through stock and bond index funds. Such a strategy is likely to be carefree, even boring, even as it is likely to be enormously productive. The role of low-cost index funds in asset allocation strategies cannot possibly be underestimated. With the current slender 2% spread, what we call the equity premium, between the prospective stock return, about 7% per year, and prospective returns on the U.S. one-year Treasury bond, about 5% in the coming decade, you can eat your cake and have it too, for index funds can deliver virtually that entire premium to investors. On the other hand, even costs as low as 2% per year for an actively managed equity fund would erase the entire premium. Result? 
Under these circumstances, a fund investor with 75% stocks in an active equity fund and 25% in bonds would earn a net annual return of 5% per year. On the other hand, an investor in a passive equity fund pursuing a far more conservative 50-50 strategy would earn 6%. 20% more return with 33% less risk would seem to be an offer that's too good to refuse. As you seek investment success, realize that it's never given to us to know what the returns stocks and bonds will deliver in the years ahead, nor the future returns that might be achieved by alternatives to the index portfolio. But take heart, for all the inevitable uncertainty amidst the eternally dense fog surrounding the world of investing, there remains much that we do know. We know that we must start to invest at the earliest possible moment and continue to put money away regularly from then on. We know that, yes, investing entails risk, but we also know that not investing dooms us to financial failure. We know the sources of returns in the stock and bond markets, and that's the beginning of wisdom. We know that the risk of selecting specific securities, as well as the risk of selecting both managers and the risk of selecting investment styles, can be eliminated by the total diversification offered by the classic index fund. Only market risk remains. We know that costs matter, overpoweringly, in the long run, and we know that we must minimize them. We also know that taxes matter, and that they too can be minimized. We know that neither beating the market nor successful market timing can be generalized without self-contradiction. What may work for the few cannot work for the many. We know that alternative asset classes such as hedge funds aren't really alternative, but simply pools of capital that invest, or overinvest, or disinvest in the very stocks and bonds that comprise the portfolio of the typical investor. Finally, we know what we don't know. We can never be certain how our world will look tomorrow, and we know even less about how it will look a decade hence. But with intelligent asset allocation and sensible investment selections, you'll be prepared for the inevitable bumps along the road and should be able to glide right over them. Our task remains earning our fair share of whatever returns that our business enterprises are generous enough to provide in the years to come. That, to me, is the ultimate definition of investment success. The classic index fund is the only way to guarantee that you will achieve that goal. If you follow the simple guidelines presented in this chapter and then stay the course, you too can be a winner. Don't take my word for it. The ideas in this closing chapter seem like common sense to me, and perhaps they seem like common sense to you as well. But if you have any doubt, listen to them echo in these words by Clifford S. Asnes, Managing Principle of AQR Capital Management. We basically know how to invest. A good analogy is to dieting and diet books. We all know how to lose weight and get in better shape, eat less, and exercise more. That is simple but it is not easy. Investing is no different. Some simple but not easy advice for good investing and financial planning in general includes diversify widely, keep costs low, rebalance in a disciplined fashion, spend less, save more, make less heroic assumptions about future returns. When something sounds like a free lunch, assume it is not free unless very convincing arguments are made and then, check again. Stop watching the stock markets as if they were on ESPN and work less on investing, not more. Perhaps the most important advice in true Hippocratic fashion is do no harm. You do not need a magic bullet. Little can change the fact that current expected returns on a broad set of asset classes are low versus history, and levering up low expected returns to make them high is not usually a great idea. Stick to the basics with discipline. Stay in the course. Earn $25,000 a year. Invest for 30 years. Accumulate $1,391,407. The simple ideas in this closing chapter really work. 
Listen to these words from a letter I received a few years ago from a Vanguard shareholder, holding our 500 index fund and total stock market index fund, several of our managed equity funds and taxable and tax-exempt bond funds, and a diversified list of individual stocks. Most of my shares were purchased when you were chairman. I am 85 years old and have never earned more than $25,000 a year. I started investing in 1974 with $500. I have only bought, never sold. I remember when things were not going well. Your advice was, stay the course. He enclosed a list of his investments at the start of 2004. Total value, $1,391,407. Of course, as a dyed-in-the-wool indexer, I believe the classic index fund must be the core of that winning strategy. But even I would never have had the temerity to say what Dr. Paul Samuelson of MIT said in a speech to the Boston Society of Security Analysts in the autumn of 2005. The creation of the first index fund by John Bogle was the equivalent of the invention of the wheel and the alphabet. Both these essentials of our existence that we take for granted every day have stood the test of time. I am certain that the index fund will do exactly that.